club. What he said was, How about you and me, show me the glove, okay? Welcome back to the Dolphin Station, 790, Dublin, Dublin. We're broadcasting live from the Superdome in the world. Where the sun is shining down to six foot holes in the moon. <laughs> no way, Drew. It's like wacky, man. W-A-X-Y. Well, thanks for that little dog. Sure. Smells like wet dogs in here, man. Dolphins are down by. Here, let me look, man. man. I know I wrote it down here somewhere. Uh, sure. Huh? We, we, we. Well, while you're looking for that, I'll love the audience with a dulcet tone of my smooth delivery. Ho oh, ho, somebody threw the ball really far. Ho oh, ho, what a game. <laughs> Look at that baby go. Mm. Oh, is that a touchdown? No, I don't know. Touch this, man. Ho oh, oh, ho, look at that fellow waiting for the water with an eight pack of cotton mellow. Hope that toilet paper don't get wet. Ho oh, oh, ho oh. ho. You know, uh, cotton mellow is a uh, good quality brand. No wonder he's trying to save it from very expensive. Mm-hmm. Ooh, we'll be back with more action packed Dolphin football on 790 after this station identification. WFUN South Miami, Florida. Victory, SBTC. I think he done it. I think I'm the only person on the face of the globe, other than the uh, prosecutor, who thinks that uh, John Mark Carr done it. I mean, is there anything else to talk about or what? No, no. 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 And you are the only one. What? Who that thinks, thinks that he done it? Well, I, done I it, didn't yeah. do it. I didn't think that at all. Right. Until. Until I started thinking about this on the, you know, in his in his yearbook, he wrote SBTC, I shall be the conqueror. I thought he wrote uh, XYZ PDQ. LMN, uh, LSM, uh, lucky strike means fine tobacco, LSMFT. <laughs> No, seriously. I know. He wrote SBTC, yeah. Shall Be the Conqueror. Now, that's on the ransom note. Now, obviously, sure. he wrote it in his yearbook in high school years before. It would be something if he had just recently written a right. note and put SBTC, but he wrote this years ago. It's in also possible. To, in addition to which, if you look at the scrawling, the, the writing, the scribbling in that yearbook mm-hmm. with his hand, that looks very much like the ransom note, which I don't know why nobody's talking about that. They I mean, have I'm, an analyst that was talking about it on CNN or one of yeah. those channels. So, and yeah. don't you see similarities? I, I do. I do. Now, of course, this business about, well, uh, his wife said, his five-year-old wife said that he was in uh, Alabama. <laughs> you know, five-year-olds don't have very good memory all the time, or very good memory. He's got some issues, okay, while he's busy digesting his duck and his uh, uh, prawns and his champagne. So big deal, they brought him back in business class. He's a people, innocent people are dying, being blown to bits all over the world, and people are worried about this fruitcake. What did I tell you the other day? Fruitcake. Oh, yeah. Did I tell you that? With his eyeliner. Yeah. His well, he is, uh, he's a lady. He's oh, a yeah. lady, like Tom Jones would say. He wants to be a lady. Whoa, he has whoa, issues. Whoa. He has issues. Just like we got issues at QAM, baby. No more crow. And you heard yourself, Clarence said we can talk about that. And by the way, Kelly, quit spreading rumors about the people across the street going out of business. They are not. Let me make it very, very clear. To the best of my knowledge, what I've been told today, they are not going out of business on the 1st of March across the street. Of course, there's a lot of businesses across the street. There's the oil change place, and then there's the uh, uh, stadium Tire, Tire Diner. Kingdom is right over here, yeah. And Chuck's uh, Sub Center, which we like Chuck a lot, even yes, though you don't do. like his food. We like Chuck a lot. You ever up Chuck a lot? Oh, yeah, just lately. At any rate, uh, so there's a lot of businesses across the street, so I wouldn't be surprised if one of them does go out of business, but it's certainly not that radio station. Joyce, I think, started that rumor. So we want to apologize for Joyce Fitch. She's got some real issues. That's the problem. You know what I'm saying? What are you saying? You can't, well, I can't say it. So which memo should I read first? Oh, and by the way, Jerry Ford, Jerry Ford, who is one of the most obnoxious people in human history, I didn't realize how evil he was until I saw, I watched two DVDs over the weekend. One, which you... See, I say they must watch them, but they won't watch them. You right. might, because I'll I send them to you. Sure. The Haunting of the President, based on the New York Times bestseller, which I did. I do have the book, but I never got around to reading it. I read a little bit of it by Joe Connison and uh, whoever else. Uh, Hunting of the President, the 10-year campaign to destroy Bill Clinton. And if you do get this DVD, by all means, because I'm not really big on going to the special features. I, I don't have time. I'm, you know, when I get a DVD, you probably are, but I don't. That depends. But in this one, there's a uh, about a 45 minute. Uh, this, this is after the screening of the movie, and Clinton comes out and talks to the audience, and it's just it is just fabulous. It's tremendous. So if you're a Clinton uh, person, or or if you hate him like poison, which is possible, and you like Kenny Starr, which I can't even imagine that, 
and Richard Mellon Scaife. Hunting of the President, I'm going to send that to you all during the break. I'll Beautiful. get that on the way. All right. And the trials of Henry Kissinger. This is the one where you find out how evil Gerald Ford was and about how he and Kissinger went to Indonesia and they met with uh, evil President Suharto. And they said, oh, you want to kill all those people in East Timor? Go ahead. They're not really any threat to you. But go ahead and butcher a couple hundred thousand people. But we'll just wait till we get back on a plane and go back to the States and yeah. give us a little bit of cover. And they did. And not to mention, of course, what they did in Chile and how they uh, got Allende out of office. They put in uh, the butcher of Chile. He's a nice old man, by the way. I see. Pin Augusto Pinochet. At any rate, you'll, uh, when you see the thing with uh, Kissinger, you, you, you actually would like to go and pick him apart cell by cell, stem by stem, piece by piece. Hey, Henry, SBTC, baby. <laughs> now, I was starting to say that uh, your former president, who's dumber than a, I think dumber than the one we got now even, although equally dangerous maybe. But he's uh, had a pacemaker put in yesterday. And you remember the British group, the British Invasion, Jerry and the Pacemakers? Absolutely. Now, do you see the way that, in fact, what was the name of that cross, song? Fair, you Ferry Across the Mercy. Mercy, right. You Ferry Across the Mercy. Anyway, here's the first memo. I've got a series of memos now, including one about Kenny Walker. I, I don't know who Kenny Walker is. I mean, they could write 400 memos, and until I hear him on the air one day next week. Now, what's the story? Next Monday, August 28th, starts the new QM lineup. Oh, oh God, it's going to be something. I didn't say it's going to be good necessarily. It's going to be something. Oh, guess what they're talking about on CNN? Take place later this morning inside the criminal... Extradition hearing for car set for 12.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I'll make sure at 12.30 that we're glued, glued to the TV, okay? Get the crazy glue out. Because is there anything else going on in the world besides John Mark Carr? Of course not. No. Speaking I mean, when you, if you would watch... Listen, of all, of all the videos, of all the DVDs, there's Curry Across the Mercy. Hey, uh, you fairy. Jerry rhymes with Mary. The Trials of Henry Kissinger, a film by Alex Gibney and Eugene Jarecki. Eugene Jarecki, by the way, you know what the other uh, DVD he did? No. He produced? Oh, you just got through watching it, and I watched it again this weekend. In fact, that's one of uh, Why We Fight. You need oh, to watch that about ten times. That was excellent. Wasn't by the way, what a, what a very easy watch. You know, not a whole lot of... Uh, statistics or anything like that, just point by point interview with people, yeah. and it was great. It's just it's tremendous, and of course, most of it has to do with Iraq and uh, all the lies and the BS. In fact, uh, Russ, uh, what's his name, Feingold from Wisconsin yesterday made a speech and was rambling and railing and screaming and carrying on about all the lies in Iraq. It's about time some of the Democrats grew a tiny pair, okay? Lies. All these people are dying. All the soldiers died because of lies, just like Vietnam. 58,000 kids came back in body bags. Anyway, the trials of Henry Kissinger. You must get this DVD. I'm going to send you both of these. How do you like that? Great. Not my copies. I'll send you. I have Amazon do it. I'll have some Amazon send it to you. <laughs> Warren Cromarty. Here's a memo from Clarence Darrow, who was in. Had a little visit from Clarence this morning, and also from Troy, who's no longer in sales. Troy's a good guy. Sure and he said that they are not going out of business. He said they're desperate to get a job across the street over there at the stadium diner. See, we can keep saying across the street, and that doesn't mean anything. Right, there's right? an animal hospital over there. There's an animal yeah. hospital. There's I've an seen that. Doctor, In fact, I, I was think, going to yeah. take Tiny there one day, but he died first. But uh, and then there's the tire, the oil change place. Remember what was her name? Oh, what the hell's her name? Who? Oh, come on, the babbling brook. <laughs> oh, don't you remember she was getting her oil change? She was getting a lube job over yeah. there and her uh, waxy uh, buildup. And Pete Bolger ran into her over there across the street and hired her to be on uh, whatever station that was at that time. Well, what station was it? Was it IOD? I don't think so. I lose track. INZ in a former incarnation. One of those. <laughs> One of those. That clear channel screwed up really bad and they destroyed mixed them and up butchered. And switched them up, and I don't, I don't know which, which is one. Anyway, so that was the deal. That, that's a true story. She was over there getting her lube uh, job. <laughs> she was getting her waxy uh, build up. Maybe, maybe that's why waxy is across the street also. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Look, we don't know sense. anything about the only thing we know about them is that everybody who used to work there is working for us now. I'll get to that memo in a minute. Toast came in this morning. Everybody who knows South Florida Radio knows Toast and Omelette. Now Omelette maybe Omelette's the guy I know. I don't know. I don't know who you know. Was it Omelette? Uh, didn't he used to work with uh Castronova? All the breakfast foods worked there. And also Toast worked on that show because Toast was on Zeta. He was on 940, whatever that means. See, they, they have an aversion to WINZ, even though those are some of the best call letters in America. You know, yes, like they are. WINS in New York, WINS 1010. I'll take well, they have an letters. aversion with WINZ, WINS. Uh, yeah, I, I don't get it. And also 790 The Ticket, Greg LaMega, a.k.a. Toast. He came in this morning. He's a good guy. He said, what am I doing here? And I said, that's a good question. You'll ask yourself <laughs> that every way. And if you're going to be in that building very much, do like Bubba did. If you want to survive, you know, do a Bill Clinton. You know what that means? Don't inhale. I have a couple ideas. Oh, okay. Don't inhale. 
I didn't know where oh, you were going with that. Oh, not the interns. We leave that to our former manager. It says Allison Terry will be joining us as executive. Oh, wait, let me get to the crow uh, thing first. Yeah, one thing at a time. Now. Warren Cromarty is no longer working at WQM. This was an internal matter, and there will be no further comment on the matter, says uh, Clarence Darrow. And I clarified this with him when he came in this morning to give us the uh, butch uh, routine, and he said, oh, that was from management, no more comment, but you can say whatever you want. The only thing I would say about that is uh, two things. Evidently, it had the controversy had to do with the fact that he wasn't getting paid. Going to the locker room and pump, pump, pump. And couldn't get his uh, paycheck. And, of course, anybody that's been around this radio station any, any more than a week should know that the Beasleys don't want to pay you on time anyway. Well, they don't Remember want to pay you on time Remember when we first came on the station and Mad Dog, who at that time wasn't, didn't have a full-time gig? Yes. Bitching every yes. time he was on the air, just screaming and carrying on, threatening not to come back because he couldn't get paid by these cheap bastards. Like little Oliver yeah. asking for so porridge. The Crow should know that up front, but evidently there was some kind of a spastic uh, deal that went on. And uh, and the other thing I would say about that is anybody with one ear that works would know he didn't belong on the ear in the first place. Put the big old red blowers in there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, blow out your ears. they got a little waxy buildup in there. So he'll probably surface across the street. That is, of course, if they're still in the... Okay, now let's see. Here's the... <laughs> you know, it was just a rumor. That's all. Joyce, it was just a freaking rumor that uh, Josh Cordes started. Well, actually, he didn't start it. You know who started it? Rock solid. There's a hint. No. No, see, you know, the only thing that really gets me is the hit and run artist. People that oh, start, yeah. all, they stir up the crap and then they like uh, crawl under the bed. Oh, I don't know nothing about that. You know, like right. that. You know, What's wrong if with you're going to open up a big mouth, then just stand up and be counted, Orlando. Rock solid. That's all. And the problem, the reason we got the information screwed up, or maybe it was just the date that's wrong. The reason that would be is because when when Josh Cortez got told that by the Big O, there was no interpreter there to like uh, clarify it. And if you speak to the Big O, you definitely need Incredibly. an interpreter. Let's see. Now here's the one about welcoming two new members to the QM staff, and here's the one about Kenny Walker joins QM in the new lineup next week. We got some heavy, heavy duty. This is Neil Rogers. Can you smell it? This is 560 QAM. Neil, God. Your DVDs are on the way. Thank you, sweetie. Lebanese and Israelis. There's a conflict in the Middle East. And it's not very small. It could be the start of World War Three. Oh, 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 Absolutely. It's a really bad with all those guns. What will spill? As I watch them kill each other, I keep wondering why. All right. They're all gonna die. What does that have to do with little John Bonet? There's a message yeah. in all of this, and that is if you want to protect your uh, little girl, don't dress her up like some kind of a hooker, okay? Yeah, put and makeup on her. don't dress her up like Britney Spears, who looks like uh, oh. a cow, man. That's wow. the latest video making the rounds between oh. her and uh, and uh, K-Fed. She looks like she's been well-fed, I'll tell you oh, that. Oh, yeah. Well, she's, she's not just pregnant, you know? she's a cow. You're she allowed to eat. She makes Oprah look like Karen Carpenter on a bad day. Anyway, here's a fact that says, please add Russ Feingold to the pool. All other potential Democrats are scum. Oh, man. Definitely they didn't put the SB word in it. That would have been really bad, as in some bitch. 
Oh, and speaking of, uh, so on Biography Channel the other day, they had Meyer Lansky again. Remember I told you I had seen that? <laughs> that clip you were playing. <laughs> no, but i got to play this clip. Jackie Mason is the best. Here we go. On the streets of heavily Jewish Miami Beach, Lansky became an elder statesman, a living legend. The most pious Jews in the world in Miami Beach were the holiest people to whom God is everything. Even God wasn't close to Maya Lansky. As soon as they saw Maya Lansky, forget about God, this was God. They used to worship him, follow him, look at him. If he walked down the street, they would talk about how slow he walked, how fast. Did he have a dog, a cow, a horse? Did he sit down, get up, what time? Once I were in this little deli down in Miami Beach, and these two young boys came up with yarmulkes on, and they were kind of looking at my grandpa, and I was kind of standing in the background. And they came up and said, Mr. Lansky, we'd, uh, we'd like to get your autograph. And he kind of looks at him seriously, and oh my grandpa, he goes, well, what did I do, an Academy Award? And I said, well, we figured it would be worth some money someday, Mr. Lansky. And he said, no, son, I don't sign autographs. No, son, I don't sign the autographs, but I walk my dog on the beach at any rate. That was his grandson, but the first part was your buddy Jackie Mason, who, uh, you know, I told you I saw Jackie Mason on the beach uh, 1956. That's uh, almost 50 years ago. Yeah, it well, is 50 years well, ago. Was he walking his dog? He was walking uh, Meyer Lansky's dog. <laughs> uh, uh, 50 years ago, and what the hell? It was not the Eden Rock. There was no Eden Rock, I don't think. What the hell was that hotel? It was up from the Atlantic. We stayed at the Atlantic Towers. My parents were schleppers. We stayed at the Atlantic Towers, and this is like a block away. And there was Jackie Mason. He looked and talked exactly the same then, exactly yeah. the same then, mm -hmm. as he does now. Old. You know what I mean? Yes. He became an elder statesman, a living legend. The most pious Jews in the world. Just like that. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's from the Mario Lansky thing on biography. It's great. Don't watch the trials of Henry Kissinger unless you want to really know what's going on in the world. And what does that have to do with poor little John Bonet? Here's another memo from Josh Darrow. It says, I would like to welcome two new members to the WQAM staff. Oh, I think they're the ones that start all those ugly rumors about uh, that business across the street going under. They'd know. First, Allison Turner. I wonder if she's related to Fran Allison or June Allison. I guess it depends. Allison Turner will be joining us as executive producer for QM and producer of the Hank Goldberg Show. Allison comes over after serving most recently as the program director of 790, The Ticket. You know, the guys across the street. Them guys. She also has experience in working in West Palm Beach in Philadelphia as well as CBS Sportsline. Second, Greg LaMega, a.k.a. Toast. He's the toast of the town. He ain't no Ed Solomon, but he's the, you know, my grandmother used to call Ed Solomon, Ed Solomon. Used to be I told you that. She yeah. thought everybody was Jewish. Mickey uh, Mendel, Ed Solomon. Could, wasn't he? Uh, Toast will be working as one of the producers on the Kenny and Bo Morning. No, that's Dave Johnson who's Jewish. Oh. The Kenny and Bo Morning Show. He's worked for many years in the South Florida market, including z the Zeta. The Zeta. What does that mean, Clarence? Including the Zeta, 940 and 790, the ticket. Oh, I see the Zeta, the ticket. You got it? I got it. He currently runs his own sports radio prep service. When he came in here, I should ask, uh, I, we were too busy uh, rekindling old memories. But I uh, should ask him what that means. What is a sports radio prep service? I don't know what that means. In well, other words, for I guess people that aren't ready still, for it. He's still booking guests uh, for Stugatz. Is that what that means, like Clarence? So that's uh, memo number two. Memo number three. Oh, my God. Well, first, before we get to that, it's too long and ponderous. <laughs> it has to do all in part with that new lineup next Monday, August 28th on WQAM, your South Florida's heritage sports radio station. <laughs> we have no idea what that means, but Clarence has come up with a great line. Our heritage sports <laughs> radio station. <laughs> As in, like you said, the Heritage Foundation. 916 votes on yesterday's George poll. What do you, did you add the uh, Russ Feingold on there, by the way? Yes, I did. Good, nice work. That means we got two Jews on there. I voted for Elliot Spitzer. Really? Oh, yeah, he's going to be the governor of New York. He's going to win that hands down. And uh, he's a great guy. He could, he could beat anybody. He could beat McCain. He could beat uh, Giuliani. He's great. I voted for Howie, even though he's, you know, he's got no chance. No I mean, chance. I, still. And we'll, well, let, we'll get to that. And we only have 804 votes. Our goal is 805 during the show. What do you wish you had a video of? George had 916 votes yesterday. Angelina Jolie and her girlfriend, 298. Cheney's secret energy meetings, 181. I wonder if Kenny Boyle was in there. Maybe his body is still in the... Uh, maybe that's where they took his body. Let's find out where the bodies are buried. Across the street. O.J. killing Nicole and Ron, 111. George Bush doing blow, 100. That's bad. <laughs> Although that's the one I voted for. <laughs> K-Fed knocking up Britney, 67. Oh, oh yeah. please. Oh, after seeing uh, I think after that was seeing the joke of vote of the day. Oh, my God. Boy, has he got talent no. or what, huh? Cheney shooting that guy in the face. Now, there's a good one. 65, <laughs> his buddy. 
Oops. So we can see how drunk and it's they like, really it's were. It's like all these uh, the Israelis and the U.S. Uh, when we bombed the wedding party. It's like, uh, oops, <coughs> sorry. Okay. You notice and um, why we fight. The thing about the, they keep showing that clip over and over again about the first, what is it, the first, I should have written it down. In the early part of the Iraq attack, mm -hmm. how many different uh, precision bombings uh, we made, and not oh, one yeah. of them hit their target. Right. Remember that? Ah, they should have attacked us. Yeah, that's true. Oh, look at that. Oh, I yeah. missed it. Damn it, it was that uh, Little Richard thing again on uh, Geico. I love that. A uh, video of the grassy Noel. See how some of these tie together? That must uh -huh. be uh, Noel Bush. That's right. Oh. The grassy Noel, 32. Noel is spelled K-N-O-L-L. -L. They've got a couple right letters in there. Nice gone, Josh. And uh, Eric, the grassy Noel. Boy, are we illiterate on this show or what? And I'm sitting here reading news stories. What a moron I am. Mel Gibson's drunken tirade. <laughs> Had About 30, man. 30 votes. I, uh, Monica Lewinsky serving Bill Clinton. No, servicing, I think, is the word you were looking for, but uh, you left a letter out. A couple oh, of well. Monica Lewinsky doing Bill Clinton 23. And who the hell would want to see that? Boy, she was a... Yeah. Oh, and you know what, what else? When you watch uh, The Hunting of the President... Yes. Now, even, uh, granted, he may not have had the best taste in the world. He did marry a swillery, after all. Mm. And he was doing uh, something with Monica. Ah. She was doing him. But take a look at that Paula Jones. Oh, I have. There is, there is no, there is nothing on the face of the globe. Even, I tell you, even this one, yeah, I, even he wouldn't do her. You, you I, need a welding mask to look. Wow. Like and Marilyn Monroe's last night, Nyan. Oh, it's, how do you like that? I didn't even look at that. Look at that. That's a beautiful psychic uh, vibe again, by the way. What's that? Nine one one. What's your emergency? <laughs> <laughs> Calling oh, for help already. She's all right. Cue him. Everybody's whipped up into a frenzy. Joyce's, but it, but it, but about, but Clarence is in it. It was great this morning, like old time. All over again. Duff was in there. She made a little cameo. Troy came by, and we had toast and omelet. How's your breakfast from Howie's doing? Oh, not here yet. Well, why not? We'll have to get us some. I had my bacon already. Don't forget two DVDs you must watch if you have an IQ larger than your small toe, okay? The Hunting of the President, the 10-year campaign to destroy Bill Clinton, and be sure to watch the special feature where he speaks at the end. It's just great, good stuff. And The Trials of Henry Kissinger, a film by Alex Gibney and Eugene Jarecki. Now, the only thing you'll say, well, uh, that lunatic is on there, that uh, Christopher Hitchens is on there. Uh, he's not really on there all that much. And don't get uh, conned in by getting the wrong DVD, because he's also got one. Yeah. He is obsessed. No, he I don't a like him. And as much as I can't stand Christopher Hitchens in many areas, the fact of the matter is when it comes to Kissinger, he's got his thumb right in it. Maybe he's just an anti-Semite. That could be it. 28 past 10 at 560 WQM. What's that lineup look like today as we're like winding down this old stodgy lineup that's doing so poorly? We got Curtis at 2, Mad Dog 4 to 630. No Hank until on the, so I guess Hank's done in the morning, the Humper, right? Correct, and he's on the Marlins on deck. The Marlins who beat Washington, in fact, they got two more games to go, so they'll probably be back to within 6 under 500 again. If they play Washington every day, they'd be undefeated. Marlins on deck at 630. How about those Blue Jays? <laughs> Blowing an 8 nothing lead last night. That was really good. Little Contra Thompson that I didn't even know about that Josh was telling me all about. What's that guy's name? Eli Lilly? Ted Lilly. Eli <laughs> Lilly. And uh, the manager, John uh, Gibbon, who uh, was aping it up in the dugout. They almost got into, like, came to blows. Lilly couldn't figure out why uh, the manager took him out of the game just because he was getting lit up like a Christmas tree and blew an 8 nothing lead. And they lost, uh, what was the score? 11-9? Uh, yeah, that's it. Something like that. Marlins and Washington at 7.05, followed by the world-famous Ed Kaplan Show. One thing about Eddie K, man, the other day parts may come and go and swing and sway like Sammy K, but Eddie K is always there. I'll tell you what else is always there, and that's Stogie's. They continue to be South Florida's top cigar shop with one of the broadest, one of the biggest, most amazing inventories containing an outstanding, unbeatable selection of over a 1,000 open boxes of cigars, including Perdomo, Ashton VSG, Arturo Fuente, Padron, Monte Cristo, Romeo and Giulietta, all the other top names you know and love, and lots more, including special, hard-to-find and obscure cigars that you won't find like in every 7-Eleven. Buy your premium cigars for the price of seconds and stick around for a while. Enjoy your smooth smoke at Stogie's in their wine lounge featuring Pierre Andre, a 100% Pinot Noir, and lots of other fine wines from all around the world. Probably almost as exclusive as the fine wine that uh, John Mark Carr was drinking on that jet from in business class. Hey, champagne. The yeah. Why is everybody so whipped up about it? So he had a little bit of duck. Duck is very fatty, by the way, and yes, probably bring him an early death. Salty, too. You'll find Stogie's at one, that's true, and very fatty. Stogie's is at 116.12 North Kendall Drive in Kendall, just a half mile east of exit 20 off the turnpike. Open every day of the week for you to light up, seven days a week for your smoking and dancing pleasure. Just tap your toe and puff away. Call today to reserve your favorite cigars at Stogie's at 305-598-9820. And when you stop into the shop, 
Don't forget to say hi to Mario and the girl, Sandra and Heather, and they'll give you a free cigar. I don't know how good it'll be, but they'll give you a little something, something to light up, and uh, you'll wander around and probably take home a whole bunch. That's Stogie's at 11612 North Kendall Drive in Kendall. Call 305-598-9820. This is Neil Rogers. This is 560 QAM. The Fox Reporter's gone. Yay, they kidnapped them. Where have the Fox Reporter's gone? Somewhere in lesbian arms. Have the rest of the neocons. Help yourself to more than one. I hope they don't return. Traitors like them should only burn. Maybe they'll kidnap her dog. Porn star did not teach her. Nap them all until they're gone. And smack their asses down. These abducts pour box in space. And wipe that smugness off their face. And cultures got to go. And don't forget, Geraldo. Do, 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 do. Big shots when they're here at home, spewing propaganda. Now they know what the ground troops know. You see real war unfolds. The world would be a safer place if you take them all away. Thank you, and by the way. Oh, in other words, you fairy. Yeah. 1035, I was just thinking about uh, what's the car dealership? Remember the time that I uh, almost got killed and I drove, I uh, was driving too fast up on the, uh, by the stadium? The one over here, uh, oh, right here on 441. Right. I forget. Well, I did, well, if we can figure, is that a Marooney place? I don't think so. Oh, well, whatever it is, we'll figure it out. Uh, they're good guys over there. They were very nice to me that day, and my head was like all uh, ballooned up and everything. I hit my head you on the a, uh, a rear big rear long goose egg. Yeah. On your At head. any rate, they were very nice to me, and then you came by and took me to the hospital, which I thought was a little over the top. Well, but nevertheless, it's better to be safe uh, than sorry. Those guys are uh, across the street. Yes, they're they up are. The street, yes, they are. And they still will be around March first, March second, March third. They've been there a long time, and they will continue being there. Just there's a mention. there's a Harley dealership across the street too. A Harley dealership will still be there in uh, on the Ides of March. Mm-hmm. This this is uh, Josh and I were talking about this before the show, before the game today, before we started game time. While the Oakland Athletics keep fighting for a playoff spot, the Toronto Blue Jays are still fighting with each other. This is according to SportsIllustrated.com, and they know their crap. When it comes to sports, in fact, I would say they're probably the heritage uh, website source. Wouldn't you say that, Josh? Uh, no, but. Keep Gibbons going. and Lily said no punches were thrown. We were on the verge of something regrettable happening. We were yelling at each other face to face, Lily said. Eli Lily. Bobby Kilty homered and drove in four runs for the A's, yada yada, who tied an Oakland record for the biggest comeback ever. Blue Jays had an eight nothing lead, but then Lily was pulled in the third inning when the A's scored seven runs. Here's the best part. Gibbons chewed out his pitcher who refused to give him the ball. He had to yank it out of his hands in the ball too. When Lily left the mound for the clubhouse, Gibbons followed him. A team trainer and a number of players then ran down the stairs. Cameramen near the dugout saw Gibbons push Lily first. Canadian press photographer Aaron Harris, one of a handful of photographers to witness the skirmish, said Lily was waiting for Gibbons in the tunnel leading to the clubhouse. Gibbons just went at him, Harris said. It looked like Gibbons grabbed him and they disappeared. Then the whole dugout emptied back. There was mayhem down in the tunnel. We can hear sounds like, do, 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 like do, 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 do. that. A television camera later showed Gibbons and the trainer wiped the manager's nose with a towel. And here's the greatest line I have ever read in the history of sports. He thought he should have been left in the game, <laughs> Gibbons said to Lily. I didn't think so. <laughs> Gibbons met with Lily after the game. We hashed it out. He said everything is fine right now. Oh, we're fine. Except uh, Lily's pitching ability, which he still sucks. He sucked before this happened, and he still sucks. He couldn't get your grandma out. He couldn't get my grandmas out, and they're both dead for a long time. He still couldn't get them out. How do you like that? Isn't that a great line? That's special. He thought he should have been left in the game. He was getting lit up like a Hanukkah bush. Yeah, he only gave up eight runs. Right. In an inning. Right. I think no outs, too. He only had an 8 nothing lead. He was only staked to an 8 nothing lead. He said, the hell with steak. I want that duck and uh, shrimp that uh, that goofy guy got. John Mark Carr. SB, uh, what is it? TCB? <laughs> TCB, STCMPA. 
I shall be the conqueror. Victory. Yeah. SBTC. Maybe you know, he's done that, it. That might be from something, literature or something. Well, like well you that. know, the interesting part of it is, though, that the, the ransom note, all the different lines in there are from different movies. None okay. of which they said the Ramseys had ever seen. They weren't big movie people, you know. They were still waiting to see Bambi and reruns. Yeah. And uh, most of the lines in the ransom note were for very well-known, bizarre movies. Did you, did you catch on to that or not? Yeah, they mentioned that. You better, you better start doing a lot more John Bonet homework, no, Mister, because no, no. there's like 85 hours a day programming on this stuff, and you're not catching up to it. I Trust watched me. right till midnight last oh. night. Well, I figure I'm doing the show. I better keep up on yeah, this I crap, know. man. I know more than I want to know about that. Case. Well, believe me, you ain't heard nothing yet. Trust me when I tell you. I heard the dog done it. Sweden State Broadcaster SVT yesterday faced ridicule for mistakenly showing a porn movie in the background of a news broadcast over the weekend. You know, I read this story. <laughs> I put it on our website. And I was thinking to myself, they're always bitching that not enough people, especially young people, watch the news on TV. Right. They're too busy watching crap, you know, like uh, America's Got Talent, even though we can't find any. If they want, if they want more people to watch the news, why can't they emulate this? Put some porno uh, movies on in the background. Don't you think that would attract a much broader audience? Sure, it would. Good idea. Viewers of a five-minute news update at midnight Saturday could not could see explicit scenes from a Czech porn movie on a TV screen behind news anchor Peter Dahlgren. This is in Stockholm, of course. What does Czech porn look like? The monitor, one of many on the wall of a control room visible behind the studio, normally shows other news channels during broadcast, kind of like in network. Remember when he was uh, right. turning on the different networks they were reporting about Howard Beale? Yes. But staffers who earlier in the evening had watched a sports event on cable channel Canal Plus, which often shows radio uh, uh, shows X-rated films after midnight, had forgotten to switch it back, said news director Perry Ying, Ying, Y-N-G, Ying. This is highly embarrassing and unfortunate, Ying said. It must not happen again. Well... A producer quickly spotted the sex scenes and ran into the control room and turned off the monitor, Ing said. He said there have been no complaints from viewers about the mishap, but enormous interest from the media. Swedish tabloids yesterday poked fun at the steamy broadcast, jokingly changing the name of the show, which is Rapport, to Rapom. Huh? Oh, ra Raporn, I see. Raporn. I see. Uh, hi. Uh, Rapport to Raporn, I was wondering. Mangus Ackerland, who oversees the hourly news updates, told Tabloid Express, and he was shocked and dismayed at the mistake. It's a huge blunder by us, he said. A huge blunder bus. You ever see a huge blunder bus? Yes, as a matter of fact. Usually, the little jitneys are a blunder bus, driven by those Haitian guys. 19 before 11 at 560. WQM, did I give our poll yet for today? I did not. That's all. It's already 20, less than 20 before 11. I still haven't given today's poll yet, and we got 868. Who should the Democrats run for president in 2008? And you may think it's a little pre a premature evaluation. You better start thinking about it right now, mister, because this regime has got to go. Got to go. Al Gore, 248. Not great, but 248. He'd be okay. He already won once. Why not give him another shot? Howard Dean, 144. Good choice, but no chance. I don't care, 111. Well, isn't that peachy keen, huh? 111 people uh, don't give a crap. Barack Obama, 87. No chance. Too dark. Hillary, 77. Oh, my God. John Edwards, 64. Too rednecky. Joe Biden, 56. Too uh, full of crap. Too wishy-washy. He's another waffler. Elliot Spitzer, that's the man. You know how many votes Elliot's got? About 30, man. But he's Jewish. I hate this poll, 29, only 3.3%. John Kerry, 17. 17, 1.9% for scary John Kerry. Wow. And Russ Feingold, who just went on there, he's going to pass Kerry like he's sitting down. He's got six, but he'll go by him. Oh, he's Jewish. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Oh, they just, you think a Jew can get elected president? <laughs> what you what are you think? laughing about? Well, it depends. Look at that Jew Lieberman. Man. How Jew he is. Because this was for Democrats. No, too Jewy. 1042 at 560 WQM. If you're going back to school can be a little rough for the kids, and a good night's sleep is critical for development of a healthy mind or even an unhealthy mind. If your kids are having trouble adjusting to school night bedtime, it may just be the mattress they're sleeping on is a piece of crap. It may be lumpy, bumpy, and had it. Done. Finito. Like a lot of us. Call Dial a Mattress toll free at 1 800 Mattress. They can recommend a mattress for kids of any age. Have a new bed delivered the date and time you choose. The same deal they've been doing for years, and nobody can come close to matching it. Seven days a week from 8 in the morning until 10 p.m., you give Dial a Mattress a two hour window, and they deliver your mattress on time, even the same day that you call if you want. 
Call 1-800-MATTRESS right now. You can be sleeping like a baby as soon as tonight. Get the absolute best selection and best prices on Sealy. Serta, Simmons, King Coral, Stearns & Foster, Hewitt, Tempur-Pedic, all the top names. And be sure and check for low prices online at mattress.com. Or you can call them at Dollar Mattress at 1-800-MATTRESS, 1-800-M-A-T-T-R-E-S. Leave off the last S because it stands for Stupendous Sensational Savings. This is Neil Rogers. This is 560 QAM. David's a bitch. Absolutely. Hey, Dick. Dick, Dick, Dick. Dick, Dick, Dick. Oh, my. I'll tell the world today that I'm a certain kind of a way that I am very gay like you didn't know. I used to make girls scream, but about the boys I dream like Justin Timberlake. I think he's so high. Don't want to live a creepy life. I want to say. Gay, 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 Oh, what did I do with that yeah. article? Don't tell me I didn't to print that out. Today is the it? end of the world. Today in history or something? No, no. It's more important than that. Oh, don't tell me I don't have that in my pile. Today is supposed to be the um, the uh, big uh, with the uh, Muslims. Oh, the big what? No. Huh? A big to-do? Yeah. And I don't think I got it in my pile here. Oh, no. That's bad. It was all about uh, there's some... Bubble my see they got about August 22nd is the day of uh, something, and I don't have it. I was sure I had it. I think you stole it. You steal I did. it? Yes, I did. I think you took it. Well, I got too many of these stupid memos here, and I got too much stuff here about John Benet. But first, I got the memo about Kenny Walker joining WQM. Everybody knows that by now. Do uh, you know who Kenny Walker is? No. Never heard of him. So I, I should probably read this uh, the way it's written. It's just it's, it's funny as hell. Sure. Time. Program director Josh Darrow of South Florida's Heritage Sports Radio Station. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, and he couldn't explain it either. 560 WQAM. I guess that's supposed to be like a little shot. Well, we were here first, okay, before all these other imitators came along. We're the Heritage Sports Radio Station. That means old. Has announced that legendary Florida radio personality Kenny Walker is joining the station effective August 20th. That's just next Monday, damn it. Walker, best known for his many years as Y100's morning show host with sidekick Footy, who's a real a-hole, will host the morning drive slot. And that, I, that's not me saying that. That's what Clarence wrote in there. Footy is a real a-hole. Will co-host the morning drive slot Monday through Friday from 7 to 10 a.m. along with Kim Bo Bo Camper for the brand new Kenny and Bo Morning Show. So we got no more Mo and we got no more Crow, but we got Kenny and Bo. How do you like that? Yo, yo, what yo. What do you know? We are very pleased to welcome Kenny as the newest member of the QM staff, said Darrow. His varied background, connection to the Dolphins, and impressive history in South Florida makes for a great addition to our already stellar lineup of air talent. Walker, the tremendously popular radio personality who Neil had never heard of until this memo, had been with Y100 for 10 years, most recently as half of the Kenny and Footy team on the Y100 morning show. Well, unfortunately, when I'm in town, I don't listen to Y100. Do you? Why? 100. Huh? No, I have never... 100. Not for I a long time, I should say. Well, I was a little years. child. Since know. Tanner was on 100 years ago. Well, That's right. And wasn't Sunny Funny, uh, Funny Socks was on there, too, for a little know. while, and she was on She. Right. Did he, he, didn't he get canned at the uh, Kiss, or I dream that? Sunny Five. Well, I, I probably I shouldn't know. have said that, either, because then uh, Joyce oh, would be yeah. calling it. Walker, the tremendously popular radio personality, been with the Y100 for 10 years, uh, yada, yada. When Kenny became available, we saw a huge opportunity to grab one of the best Love DJs in South Florida and put them on WQAM. The com DJs. Uh, what was, uh, the combination of Kenny and Kim Bo Camper for the Kenny and Bo Morning Show is something we are very confident and excited about. I know thousands of fans have been missing Kenny's presence on the air, and we are thrilled to have him as part of the team, said Joe Bell, WQM General Manager. Now, do you think that those 10-year-old kids that listen to Y100, those people are going to be listening to WQAM? We well, sure hope so. They will be now. Because anybody over 15 don't have any idea who Kenny Walker was, but I'm sure he's going to be great. 
Walker, the voice of the Dolphins, is their in-stadium PA announcer after Joe R- uh, J. Roe Keats got canned because he was too... Now, wait a minute. J. Roe Keats, was he doing the Dolphins or just the Marlins, Josh? I'm not sure if he was doing the Dolphins. But you did, he did get canned by the Marlins. I don't know nothing about that. Yeah, J. Roe Keats, you know, he, they thought he was too sophomoric, you know, like when he does the U.M. stuff, you know. Hurricane, home run by number seven, you know, like that. Okay. He's a silly guy. But his family made a lot of money in pickles. and the, They're in the pickle business. Don't tell Joyce that. Walker, voice of the Dolphins, as in their stadium PA announcer, is the proud father of three and married to Dory Grogan, director of the Dolphin Cheerleaders and Event Entertainment. Oh, my God, that sounds like a really incestuous setup to me. Uh, the good kind. I didn't say that. I just said an incestuous relationship. Mm-hmm. She's uh, the Dolphins. I wonder if they know Fudge Brown. Probably. Heck of a job, Brownie. Other changes in the sports radio QM lineup will take place August 28, 2006, and will include... The Big O, Orlando Alzagiri, who started all those rumors about across the street, by the way. Rock solid. Monday through Friday, 5 to 7 a.m. Isn't that true, Josh? Don't say anything. Huh? Just a nervous (laughs) laugh. You know it's true. You wouldn't want to tell me, but somebody told me. I think it was George said it. It's amazing the way those Cubans turn on each other like a cornered rat. The Kenny and Bo Morning Show with Kenny Walker and Kim Bo Bo Camper, coma-inducing Kimba, Monday through Friday, 7 to 10 a.m. Neil Rogers, 10 to 2. Just like you're you're not even getting mentioned here. Mad Dog, Jim Mandich, 2 to 4 p.m. Mad Dog, Jim Mandich, and the Hammer Hank Goldberg, 4 to 5 p.m. together. The uh, most expensive hour in South Florida radio, 4 to 5. The Hammer Hank Goldberg uh, solo, 5 to 7 p.m. So, in other words, Mad Dog's doing 2 to 5, Hank's doing 4 to 7, and they had an hour cross dress. Game broadcast and sports talk, Monday through Friday, 7 to 10 p.m., and Ed Kaplan, 10 to 2. I said, where's Geldy in this? And Fred said, you got to think I'm going to put a guy who sounds like that on the air? I said, good point. And then there's a thing on the bottom of this. This is hysterical. This press release. I bet you didn't put a press release out about our uh, spring rating book, did he? Clarence Zero. Because this show was the one that kicked ass while the others were sucking hind wind. But he didn't put a memo out about that or a press release because we might have gotten some uh, mention somewhere. Like by Barry Jackass. Then here's the thing about the Beasley Group, which the less said about them, the better. Uh, founded in 1961. Owns or operates 42 stations, 26 FM and 16 AM, in 10 large and mid-sized markets in the U.S. Oh, yeah. In addition to Sports Radio 560, in the Miami market, Beasley owns 99.9 Kiss Country, WKRS, Power 96, Money Talk Radio, WSBR AM 740, which there are six people listening to that, Health Talk Radio, WWNN 1470, which I think that's the station that Mr. E goes on, I'm not sure, and WHSR AM 980, and nobody knows what that is. Do you know what it is? I asked Clarence, he had no idea. No. Uh, and now, here comes the best part. <laughs> Beasley's WQAM, WKIS, Power 96, WWNN, and WHSR AM are now broadcasting in crystal clear CD quality sound made possible by HD radio technology for those six people who have access to HD radios. Don't you love our crystal clear signal? <laughs> like that. Oh, God, I love it. Just wait till people get that it? radio. Huh? Just wait till people get that radio. Oh, yeah. Wait. Well, here's an article by Bob Geiger. A lot of words, but who's counting? That's cute. All, no, this is good. This is perfect. I love this. All John Bonet all the time. I can't believe I don't have that article about August 22nd. Is this the end of the world today? There's some big hocus-pocus mumbo-jumbo um, jumbo jet. I don't know where the hell I can't find it. I'm gonna. Did I put it on our website, Josh? Um, I don't know. You wouldn't know. I sent you so many I breeze stories. through those things, man, and there's like 90 <laughs> of them. So. Get out of here. Come on. What? No. I'm not cutting back. About half of those. Oh, I know. I know. If I cut back on the stories, then I cut back on the checks, okay? Like once every five years. And since I only got two years to go, let's see. Is the um, I don't think it's on there. I'm looking at the different stories. Now I don't, now I don't know where, where the hell I had that. Maybe I dreamed it. Do you think I dreamed it? It's possible. I know I didn't dream it. I've seen it. August 22th. It's like uh, that episode in Berlin. I know I didn't dream that, but I might just as well have. Uh, at any rate, can't find it. Very important, though. Today's the end of the world. Bob Geiger writes in, uh, what is this, uh, where is he write? Bob Geiger in, um, oh, the uh, Globe and Mail, Toronto Globe and Mail. All John Bonet all the time. In the news this morning, this was uh, yesterday, we have yet another bloodbath in Iraq. His gunmen shoot up a Shiite religious procession in Baghdad, killing at least 16 people, injuring 230. About 30, man. More American troops have been killed in Afghanistan by Taliban insurgents. Guess we didn't really get rid of the Taliban before George W.'s Iraq disaster was started. And there's renewed trouble in the tenuous Middle East ceasefire. And what's the top story on all the cable news channels this Sunday morning? 
the John Benet Ramsey case and the gripping fact that the newly discovered suspect, John Mark Carr, is on a plane and coming back to the U.S., eh? Are He's you drank kidding champagne! Me? Are you kidding me? Really? Are you freaking kidding me, he says? Don't get me wrong, I'm the father of a nine-year-old boy, and I can appreciate the horror of any child being murdered, but this case is one child, it's over a decade old, and at this point, there are serious questions over whether Carl will even turn out to be a viable suspect in the killings. SBTC, baby, PTA. Elemental P. Lucky strike means fine tobacco, LSMFT. This may be an important regional story in Colorado where the killing occurred, and perhaps the seventh or eighth story told to a national audience, but considering everything else of real importance that truly affects the stability of our planet and real people's lives, this is nowhere near the top story on our national news. Adding to what will continue to be an ongoing media obsession with this case, in which our single-threaded corporate media finds this to be the only story they can cover, is the fact that it's now been revealed that Carr was a patient at a Bangkok clinic that specializes in sex change operations, and it looks like Carr went there for treatments. Oh, boy, the only way this gets knocked out of the news now is if some winsome blonde chick goes missing in the Caribbean. Ooh. So here's a chicken and egg question. Have the American people become so dumbed down because this is the kind of non-story that the corporate media beats into the ground for hours on end and for days at a time? Or does the media do it because we become so vacant and disinterested in real news that this is the kind of stuff we all really care about? I would say both of the above. There's a lot of speculation going on about whether Carr's story even makes sense, and a friend of mine who's both a lawyer and writer said he wouldn't report more than a one-liner about this until DNA evidence or other indisputable proof verifies that Carr causes little girl's death. For the sake of our national awareness and intellect, I hope DNA testing is done quickly, and whoever should be caring so intensely gets to the bottom of this case. Even if Carr does turn out to be the killer, this is not the top story in the world right now. It's not even close. And what if it's discovered that he's just an attention-seeking nutcase that had nothing to do with it? At this point, the media's pushed this as the story we should all care about to the exclusion of all others. They made the decision that a suspect in a 10-year-old murder case and the fact that he's getting on an airplane is more important than the incendiary situation in the Middle East, a civil war in Iraq that's killing an average of 100 people a day, and the way our own involvement in that quagmire drags our country further into the toilet every day. And even if they did focus on these real stories, they should still find time to talk about 46 million Americans with no health insurance and looming oil crisis that will have severe impact on people as winter approaches. That's what journalists are supposed to do for a living. But in defiance of all of that, now we're assaulted with all John Bonet all the time. In their warped news judgment, the media is deciding for all of us what we should be more concerned about, minute-by-minute minute developments with John Mark Carr, than the fact that our brave men and women continue to be lost in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're making a decision every hour that a story of such incredibly specious importance is more relevant than the deaths of our men and women serving in uniform overseas. And for that fact alone, they should be profoundly ashamed that it did. This is Neil Rogers. Absolutely this is 560 QA. <laughs> My dad loves me all the time. He makes me when he ties me up. Are you sure? When I went on the name Ramsey, I was Don't you believe a word of that, man? He uh, didn't do it. Uh, the dog done it. And, of course, uh, John Mark Carr, he did it. SBTC, baby. LSM, uh, how's that go? L uh, Lucky Strike. LSMFT. <laughs> we can't say MF. Sorry, Joyce. No. Anyway, I finally found this thing about August 22. Oh, good. Yeah. What the hell is it? It's a date for Armageddon, writes a Brian Whitaker in the British Guardian. This information comes from no lesser source than the Wall Street Journal, where Bernard Lewis, President Bush's favorite historian, provides the details. In Islam, as in Judaism and Christianity, the professor wrote, there are certain beliefs concerning the cosmic struggle at the end of time. Gog and Magog, Antichrist, Armageddon, and for Shiite Muslims, the long-awaited return of the hidden imam, ending in the final victory of the forces of uh, good over evil, however those may be defined. The hidden imam. I wonder if he's kin to the, uh, what's that other one? Um, Modad. Who? When you take your little kid to the ice cream store, no kid enough, he always says, I want Modad. Oh, okay. Now, we'll get to that. Will you listen to this? <laughs> Mr. Ahmadinejad, see now that huh? I can actually say it, wow. I enjoy it. 
the Iranian nutcase president. And by the way, uh, isn't it great that we uh, put uh, Pinochet in Chile and we put uh, we let Soharto go in there into East Timor and all this murder and bloodshed and slaughter that's been going on all over the I can't imagine why there's so many people in the world hate America. They hate us for Why don't they like us? They're jealous. God Almighty, we do such wonderful things for them. You, wait, you, when you see the trials of Kissinger, when you hear him uh, trying to respond to these things, the, you, I don't know whether you're going to pee in your pants or just on the floor. You would all anyway, hear anti-Semitic propaganda. Mr. Ahmadinejad and his followers clearly believe that this is the time, the time is now. Not to mention, of course, Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge. Nice job there, too, guys. See, we invented all of these, uh, just like we invented uh, Al-Qaeda. And the Israelis right. invented Hezbollah and uh, Hamas, but nonetheless... Mr. Ahmadinejad, see, I keep going back to the beginning so I can say it again, and his followers okay. clearly believe that the time is now and that the terminal struggle has already begun and is indeed well advanced. Although I just saw there on CNN, the certainly Nazi news network, including Wolf Blitzkrieg, that, uh, who's a former APAC guy, I just saw that a blurb on there that Iran says they wanted to get into serious uh, talks on nuclear uh, stuff. Huh. They said it's a bomb. It's a gas. It may even have a date, it says, indicated by several references by the Iranian president to giving his final answer to the U.S. about nuclear development by August 22nd. Lewis continues, what is the significance of August 22nd? That's today, by the way. This year, August 22nd, corresponded to the Islamic calendar to the 27th day of the month of Rajab in the year 1427. This, by tradition, is the night when many Muslims commemorate the night flight of the Prophet Muhammad on the winged horse Barak first to the farthest mosque, usually identified with Jerusalem, and then to heaven and then back. This might well be deemed an appropriate date for the apocalyptic ending of Israel and, if necessary, the world, it says. And they just said that they want to sit down and have some serious talks on nukes. Please don't bomb us. This sort of quasi-religious scaremongering always finds a receptive audience in the U.S., especially among Christians of jihadist persuasion, writes Brian Whitaker in The Guardian. At 90 years old, Professor Lewis may have completely lost his marbles, but he is still fated by the White House. Vice President Dick Cheney was guest of honor at his birthday party in April, and the Wall Street Journal describes him as a sage. He is credited with coining the phrase, Clash of Civilizations in 1990, and now seems intent on making it a rea <laughs> reality. Nevertheless, Professor Lewis does manage to spot a few drawbacks in his alleged Iranian attempt to obliterate Israel. An attack that wipes out Israel would almost certainly wipe out the Palestinians, too, he writes. This might well be of concern to the Palestinians, but not apparently to their fanatical champions in the Iranian government. He then suddenly demolishes his own, his own argument with this caveat. It is far from certain that Mr. Ahmadinejad plans any such cataclysmic event precisely for August 22. So why exactly did the Iranians choose August 22 as the date for giving the answer to the U.S. about nuclear development? Which they said, let's talk. Probably for bureaucratic convenience. When they promised to reply by the end of August, they didn't actually use the word August, but the Iranian equivalent. If you look at the Persian calendar or your Persian carpet, you'll see that August 22th just happened to be the end of the month known as Mordad. See how we got to that, Mordad? Got it. Bless Mom, Mordad. I don't suppose this will discourage the neocons from continuing to write such loopy, prophetic nonsense. Here's another them. Michael Leiden, formerly a key figure in the Iran-Contra scandal and the Iraq-Niger yellow cake affair, Niger, excuse me, predicting an Iranian nuclear test by November 5. That's my birthday. They're going to do it in honor of me, in honor of... Neo God. The Iranians believe they now have all the necessary components uh, for a nuclear bomb. The only question is how long it will take them to assemble and test it. Khomeini had hoped to be able to test an atomic bomb by the third week in October, but his scientific advisors recently told him that they could not make that deadline. Now they're aiming for November 4th or 5th, the anniversary of the seizure of the American embassy in Tehran during the Revolution. There is another November date our leaders should take seriously, the 25th, the anniversary of the disappearance of the 12th Imam, and thus the most significant date in the Shiite calendar. Reports from Tehran suggest that the Mullahs would like to celebrate that anniversary with a big-time terror attack against America. And then it says, he writes, Brian Whitaker says, utter tosh. What a silly Brit. Utter tosh. Don't believe a word of it. Leiden was not talking about this coming November, but November 2003. And then he's got a link to the original article. So obviously that's three years ago and didn't happen. But nevertheless, how do you like that? Interesting. So today's supposed to be the end of the world. And how are we going to find out about who killed John Bonet? I mean, if there's one thing we tomorrow. want to live for. 941 votes on the poll. Who should the Democrats run for president in 2008? Let's have the election this week, I say it'd be a good idea. Al Gore, 257. 267. Who won in 2000, but somebody, I think, made him an offer he couldn't refuse. I think a lot of people were made an offer they couldn't refuse. You know what I mean? No, what do you mean? Uh, otherwise, how could everybody have just uh, gone silent? I, I just, uh, I mean, I realize that a lot of people uh, don't have many balls, or any balls, but nevertheless... Somebody. I'm going to make him an offer. He can't refuse. Did that. Al Gore, 267. Howard Dean, 150. I don't care, 123. 13%. That's an unlucky number for you. Barack Obama, 94. And unlucky for you if you don't make that deal with Santino. Hillary, 81. 
John Edwards, 73. Joe Biden, 61. Elliot Spitzer, 32. He's moving up a little, slowly but surely. That's because they haven't got any idea. He's the Attorney General of New York. He's a good guy, man. He's a no-nonsense. He reminds me of um, Elliot Ness. You know what I mean? No, what? Boring? Wearing a trash coat? What? Yeah. No, he was once played by Robert the Stack. I see. Well, I can't believe that Robert Stack is dead. I just, uh, I mean, I see those unsolved mysteries, the old ones yeah. come on here. Happens to everybody. I hear his voice, man. I just get goosebumps. He had such a great voice, you know? Yes, he did. And even in Airplane, he was great. I'm not sure who was better, him or uh, Lloyd Bridges. Elliot Spitzer, 32. I hate this poll, only 29, 3%, but then again, we got the I don't care crowd picking up the slack. John Kerry, 19, and Russ Feingold, I told you, 13. A lucky number for him because he's Jewish. Great guy. He's got a huge peer. And now he's got 14. 945 votes. Our goal is 1,000 by 2. If we get 1,000 earlier than that, you're finishing the show. I got a story here about, guess what it's about? What? I didn't, a? Clue. <laughs> I didn't even give you the clue yet. Was it right? It says, Aboard Thai Airways to Los Angeles, written by Jocelyn Gecker, the A&P. I like the star market myself. Now, the star market was filthy. But I sure hope they're not in business anymore. I better, I better do this one before the break. We'll take some calls today, like this one on line nine is going to be really good. Who I am? Uh huh. Mumbai's Hitler's Cross eatery angers Indian Jews. A new restaurant in India's financial hub, named after Adolf Hitler and promoted with posters showing the German leader in Nazi swastikas, has infuriated the country's small Jewish community. Mumbai. Hitler's Cross, which opened last week, that's the name of the joint, serves up a wide range of continental fare and a big helping of controversy, thanks to a name the owners say they chose to stand out among hundreds of Mumbai eateries. We wanted to be different. This is one name that will stay in people's mind, owner Punit Shablok told Reuters. We're not promoting Hitler, but we want to tell people we're different in the way he was different, like a really crappy mustache and a beard haircut. Don't you love the way he used to comb his head, that comb over, you know, off the uh, road, wrong greasy, side of his head? Greasy, greasy strand swath But hand. India's remaining Jews, most migrated to Israel and the West over the years, say they're outraged by the gimmick. This signifies a severe lack of awareness of the agony of millions of Jews caused by one man, said Jonathan Solomon, chairman of the Indian Jewish Federation, the community's umbrella organization. We're going to stop this deification of Hitler, he said without elaborating. The small restaurant, its interior done out in Nazi colors of red, white, and black, also has a lounge for smoking the exotic Indian water pipe or hookah. Oh, no. Go in and get a hookah. Posters line the road leading up to it featured a red swastika carved in the name of the eatery. One slogan reads, from small bites to mega joys. That sounds awfully anti-semantic to you, you know I wonder what Jackie Mason would think of Miami Beach. Lansky became an elder statesman, a living legend. The most pious Jews in the world in Miami Beach were the holiest people to whom God is everything. Even God wasn't close to Maya Lansky. As soon as they saw Maya Lansky, forget about God, this was God. They used to worship him, follow him, look at him. If he walked down the street, they would talk about how slow he walked, how fast. Did he have a dog, a cow, a horse? <laughs> That's great. I'm just playing that till 2 o'clock. When you got that clip, who needs anything more, right? Who needs anything more? Right. Doi, 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 doi. 11.13 at 5.60 WQM. Happy August 22th to you, baby. It's the end of the world. It's the Mo Dad, or whatever the hell it was. What was it? Mo, uh, SBTC, baby. <laughs> Victory, SBTC. <laughs> well, I don't know what you're laughing about. I shall be the conqueror. What do you think that's the for? I don't the know. Note? I want you to tell me, by, when we come back from the break, what you think SBTC, the significance in that ransom note. Huh? Okay, I'll make something up. Good. SBTC my ass, and it doesn't take good eyesight to see it. I'll tell you one other thing. You'll, you'll be drowning in a sea of food when you head to the Emerald Coast. You'll see it all, all over the place. And Lobster Fest is back every weekend, every Friday through Sunday at the Emerald Coast. The best Chinese buffet in all of South Florida. Man, there, everybody and their brother now is opening up Chinese buffets. A lot of imitators, but nothing like the original, the Emerald Coast. Three locations for you. They're in Sunrise, Pembroke Pine, Sunny Isles Beach. When you've got a big appetite, this is the place for you. Over a hundred different items on the Emerald Coast buffet. Start out with six gourmet soups. In fact, try them all. Stick some in your pants. Then go for the New York steak, juicy and delicious, grilled to the way you like it. Hand-carved prime rib. There's a sushi bar and all the traditional Asian dishes as well as a salad bar and a seal bar. There's so much food, you'll be lost, man. You won't even know what to chow down on next at the Emerald Coast. I got some ideas, though. And their dessert bar is spectacular during the week, but on the weekends, the 40-inch chocolate fountain will make your mouth water. You'll be hand-dipping your strawberries, marshmallows, cheesecake, all kinds of decadent treats. It's from the Bible. In loads of the milk chocolate for dessert. What's that? I shall be the conqueror. It is? Yes. You, you Googled it. Yes. You cheated. Yes. Anyway, stick it in there. A perfect ending to a feast at the Emerald Coast, which uses only healthy cholesterol-free canola oil and never any MSG, so no pounding headaches when you walk out of there. Just a big smile on your fat puss as you waddle out. 
Bring the whole family real soon to the Emerald Coast for a real pig out. And don't forget, every Friday through Sunday, it's Lobster Fest. You can just dis- in fact, go in there when they open and stay there until they kick you out. For reservations, call 954-572-3822. 954-572-3822. And don't forget, SBTC. From the station that brought you dead celebrity concerts. What the hell? <laughs> what the hell was that? Oop. Huh? It was funny. That could have been a mistake, wrong. could it? My and local. I like this. This is Sports Radio 560. QA QAM. Hi, this is G. Gordon Liddy, and they don't come any worse than Neil Rogers. If you can't get enough of top-lifting, breast-exposing action, then we've got the DVD for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Grills Gone Wild. It's the hottest video of the biggest breasts and most luscious thighs. Oh, baby, my mouth is watering. I want to baste them. Order now, and you'll also get Grills Gone Wild Mardi Gras. Show me some beads, and I'll show you these. Whee! Style, I got on D. And Grills Gone Wild Spring Break Cookout. Show us your beef dips. Show us your beef dips. And for the ladies, it's Grills Gone Wild Frank's Wieners and Sausages. I just love a big, thick, juicy kielbasa. Oh. Food has never been hotter, so order Grills Gone Wild today. You may just kiss the cook. I prefer a nice drop myself. It's 1119 to 560 WQM. We got 973 votes on the poll. We're going to have our 1,000 by 1130. How do you like that? Or close to it. Aren't you impressed? Yeah. We're not. I'm impressed, <laughs> man. I'll tell you why I was inspired to do this poll. Okay. Because of a story from Raw Story. Boy, I love that website. Not as much as I love watching these two uh, DVDs over the weekend. The Trials of Henry Kissinger and The Hunting of the President, the 10-year campaign to destroy Bill Clinton. You'll see what a slimeball Kenny Starr really is on there, in case you didn't already know it. And, you know, remember he was going to uh, resign as special account- prosecutor and he was going to go uh, take right, a job teaching yes, at Pepperdine? I, I do remember. Well, guess who's the main uh, funder, the main uh, 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 hotshot donor to Pepperdine University? I Richard Mellon Scaife? Oh, yeah. Oh. And then finally, after the whole thing was over and they blew it and they didn't uh, convict Clinton, guess where uh, he wound up, Kenny Starr? Pepperdine. He's the same uh, Richard Mellon Scaife that uh, puts all the words in Matt Miss Drudge's mouth. I'm not sure what else, but... A new poll published this week in Time Magazine finds former Vice President Al Gore. I'm going to tell you something. He's making a comeback, even though some of you may be laughing right now, although he's doing well in our poll. Some of you may uh, be laughing a little bit. Where the hell is that thing where he just uh, goes nuts? Huh? I don't know. It's in here. So Here it is. How dare they drag the good name of the United States of America through the mud of Saddam Hussein's torture prison. Abu Ghraib. I mean, who, you know, look what Pop had, and we got, uh, look what we got now. Pop had Gore, and we got Bush. Anyway, the poll in uh, Time Magazine says Al Gore, who insists he isn't running, trails Senator Swillery Clinton by only five points. The poll finds Gore and Hillary splitting a large majority of Democratic support, 46 to 41 percent. It further finds the senator from New York to be a wildly polarizing figure. I can't stand her man for like two seconds. Me either. She's as phony as a $76.5 bill. Yes, she is. Hillary Clinton may be the most polarizing figure on the current political landscape. Time has respondents about 11 phrases one could use to describe her, from likable to would protect America against terrorism. Democrats and Republicans disagreed by a margin of over 40 points on the applicability of eight of them, and by 50 points on three of them, including strong leader, uh, Democrats at 77%, Republicans 25, would protect America against terrorism, Democrats 67, Republicans 17, has uh, strong moral values, Democrats 69, Republicans 16, yada, yada. Democrats and Republicans came closest in agreement on her intelligence, Democrats 91%, 73%, and the likelihood that she'd stand up for important issues to women. Perhaps a sign that whatever her other problems as a candidate, she's not being held back by gender stereotypes. Well, she's a dyke, what do you expect? In fact, maybe, you ever see her and John Mark Kay together? Car, oh, good point. Or it could mean that Republicans hate her so much they don't care if she's smart. Partisan divisions even color views of her partisanship. Hillary proponents have a small read of hope to grasp in the 60% of independents that agree with Democrats that politically she's somewhere in between liberal and conservative. Perhaps the most intriguing partisan divide comes when Bill Clinton enters the picture, whereas 57% Democrats agreed that Hillary should have stayed with Bill despite his affair with Monica, only 32% of Republicans back as the Defense of Marriage Act agree. I wonder what Jew Lieberman is saying now about that. Oh, and all of a sudden you notice how Jew Lieberman is talking about how Donnie Rumsfeld ought to step down and all these terrible things and the way the war is being conducted so badly and all this bloodshed in the city. You notice that? How he's changing his tune real fast? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, boy. Too late. Yeah. Anyway, George took this poll uh, on Friday over the weekend. Now, did you get a lot of calls on this about this uh, John Mark Carr? Because that's all they're talking about. Uh, no. Oh, there's Osama on CNN with the Christiane Ammon Purr, same person. Within the news media, there was quite a lot of comment. Oh, and there's that commie pinko Peter Arnett. Communist. Anyway, who do you think killed John Bonet? Don't know and don't care. 719. Overwhelming. 42.1%. Well, you better know and you better care, okay? Like that article that I read uh, a little while ago said. All John Bonet, all the time, right? Right. Someone we haven't found yet, 297. Don't know, 246. The dad, 163. And the mom, 163. Even Stephen. Of course, she's off the hook now. And John Carr, the weird guy that confessed, only 117. Now, what do you tell me about SBTC? It's from the Bible? A, a modified version, depending on which translation. Judges chapter 8 has a line like that. The well, Koran? The Old Testament. Your the Bible. The Bible? Your ba Bible, baby. Oh, the Jew Bible. Yeah, what did you, you say? You know it. And what I'm, I'm trying to get out? the exact passage over here, but it doesn't uh, add up exactly. There's more to that line, too, in his yearbook. Well, what that's is a, it? That's an excerpt. Well, so what the, difference does it make? None, I guess. I shall be the conqueror, and that's what it said at the end of the ransom note. It Victory, says, SBTC. The, the line in the yearbook said, maybe I shall be the conqueror and live in multiple peace. And if you notice, the, uh, the scribbling on there looks just like the scribbling on a ransom note. It does look similar. Yeah. Looks a hell of a lot more similar than, uh, than the stuff from, uh, what's her name, the, the dead one, Patsy. She's just a Patsy, I told you. So did you get a lot of calls about that? What are no. they saying? I didn't you didn't get, get a lot of calls about any. that? That's 24-7. Any. It's even on the Food Channel, man. Not one. Even on the Food Channel, they're showing him uh, dining on uh, duck and uh, 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 prawns and sh champagne. John Mark Carr, the, suspect, the suspect in the death of six-year-old John Benet Ramsey, sipped champagne, ate uh, what? fried champagne. tea prawns. Oh, fried food. That's bad for you. In business class Sunday, after being put aboard a flight to L.A. to face charges in the U.S.A., as Carr whined and dined in style and chatted with the three U.S. officials escorting him, another bombshell emerged. Reports that Carr saw treatment at a Thai sex exchange clinic. Oh, my God. His Thai Airways international flight took off about 8 p.m. for the 15-hour flight to L.A. Oh, he's uh, on the way to Boulder. Is he in Boulder yet? I don't know. I think he's getting there 11.30 our time. No, I'm not following it as closely on as there. I should be. they got Peter Bergen on there talking about uh, terrorism in Bin Laden right now, but that won't last very long. Because in about five minutes when his plane touches down in Boulder... Then, then you'll see. Uh, although, how can that be? Is he going to Boulder? I thought that the hearing was at 12:30. I don't know. I'm confused. Car neatly dressed in a red short sleeve button-down shirt. But what kind of underwear was he wearing? You, you read, I'll tell you. I knew he was a fruitcake from the beginning. I say fruitcake just means oddball. If you if you right. see all the all the uh, film footage they got of him from and then the pictures they got, he had a pear-shaped ass. Oh well, that proves it. Oh no, a guy, a guy with a pear-shaped ass. That's no, really yeah. a woman fruitcake. in disguise. Sure. It's just like, uh, what's her name? They're on um, CNN. When you, they call Hank? Barbara oh, Starr. yes. Every time Barbara Starr comes on, George says, oh, Hank's on TV now. That, that's, that is so <laughs> grotesque. You know? So cheap. What a funny. cheap shot. At who? Her. Anyway, Barbara Starr, she does not have a pair. In fact, I think John Mark Carr, he's got the pear-shaped ass that she was supposed to have if she was really a woman. She's got a manly, hairy ass. Now, what did you do about these... <laughs> About these spots I, I don't that Chris keeps I got to take them care of. Don't you worry. You got all that straightened out? Yes, we did. Well, that's good. I, I should have known. I it's supposed to be recorded. It was a... And it is. Oversight. It was an oversight? And or, or an undersight. Made. How about that billboard he's got on there? Did we do the billboard yet? Did we mention that no more no more crow on QAM? Which means there's an opening for Troy Stratford to sneak right into, and he was already on there this past weekend. Now, what day did this happen, this big blow up with the, the crow? Must have been on a weekday because uh, uh, the yeah, uh, like day before yesterday. I'm not the people sure. in the payroll people, the accounting people wouldn't have been there on a weekend. Now let's see. I'm looking for oh, Lenny Martez Saturday morning eight to nine. Be sure to miss that. I don't see Troy Stratford on the schedule at all for this weekend. I'm looking at the uh, well. What, oh, I see four to five thirty. I bet she's going to sneak in that Saturday. It says TBD at Gate F at the stadium before the Marlin Brewers game. Oh, that that should be a big attraction. The Marlins and the Brewers. Wow. How many people do you think are going to show up for that game, Josh? About 30, man. That should be big. 27 past 11 at 560 WQAM SBTC. This is Neil Rogers. This is 560 QAM. Neil God. Contestant number one, what is your name, please? My name is John Mark Carr, and I killed John Bonet Ramsey. Contestant number two. My name is John Mark Carr, 
And I killed John Benet Ramsey. Contestant number three. My name is John Makar, and I killed John Benet Ramsey. One of these men killed John Benet Ramsey. The other two are imposters. Find out who the real John Makar is, which we all play to play the truth. Now, here's your host, Carl Rowe. I welcome to my business panel, Larry King, Rita Carlton, and Mr. Dick Clark. And now, as head of your Ministry of Truth, let's begin to play with the truth. Miss Crosby. Uh, yes. Yes. Mr. King. <laughs> Contestant number two. That was uh, ten years ago, was it not? Yes. Did you then, or do you now, have change for a twenty? Yes, I do. Here. If two fives and a ten is good. Thanks. It's good. <laughs> Mr. Dick Clark. <laughs> And now, will the real killer of John Benet Ramsey please stand up? Oh, we're sorry, ladies and gentlemen. We have another terrorist warning. Remove your shirts and pants. And stay tuned for more fear as we pay the truth. They sure came at a very opportune time, didn't it? This bush must be dipped in a bucket of stuff, you know? Bucket Every of what? time things get really, really ugly and bad, whether it's in Iraq or in Lebanon or whatever, and things are starting to look really, really grim, all of a sudden we either have like a terror alert that nobody buys into, and then that didn't work, and now we got uh, John Mark Carr. I, fi- I Googled it, and I found out what it really stands for. Okay. When Clarence became program director at QAM, SBTC, small balls take charge. <laughs> that, that's what that stands for. But it can also okay. stand for the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention which is coming up September 8th and 9th in Fort Worth. You want to be sure and catch that. The Southern Baptist Texas Convention. It also stands for uh, Ministry of Small Business, Tourism, and Culture in Canada. Huh. SBTC, Saved by the Cross, Small Business Technology Coalition, Stream-Based wow. Trace Compression. Hmm? You ready for this? Wow. Oh, yeah. And there's a whole bunch of other ones, too. You know, uh, SB International, uh, some kind of company, there's something. Uh, uh, SBTC.co.uk, uh, they make telescopes and binoculars. Uh, SBTC, Sotramar Envy Company of Infomine, whatever that all means. Uh, SBTC, Sociedade Brasileira de Terapias Cognitivas. Really? What the hell does that mean? I don't know. Brazilian Society of uh, something, of uh, clueless bastards. So there you go, SBTC. Now, I still don't understand what you were saying. It's from the Bible? Well, supposedly, according to Susan Candiotti and a CNN transcript. Well, there's somebody we actually like see on CNN, right. Susan Candiotti. She's the only one, I think. In Judges, chapter 8, the Bible says, I shall return a conqueror in peace, blah, blah, blah. But I'll be damned if I can find it. Oh, well, look what's on right now. With more on that, our Jeffrey Tubin is on the phone. Oh, it's the uh, afternoon hearing. Jeffrey I knew there was something uh, happening at 1130. This could mean John Carr is heading to Boulder, Boulder Colorado Boulder, very bitch. soon, or this could stretch out for weeks. It probably means he's going to leave very shortly. There's really only a very narrow issue at stake in the next... And by the way, guess who I discovered was a very, is a good guy? Jeffrey Tubin on CNN. There's another guy we like. That's his voice. There he is right there. He's a good guy. Okay. I'll write it down. He's not one of those right-wing apologists uh, in the, in the, uh, on the payroll kind of guys. 5670560. Oh, Maybe the audience knows what SBTC stands for, huh? We could take a poll. No, not a poll. How about some suggestions? Not a poll. Victory, SBTC, and then he has that in his uh, yearbook, written uh, years earlier. Mm-hmm. How, how much earlier would that have been? He's 41 now. Is that how old he is? Is if anybody cares? Yes, he's 41. She is? Yes, it is. So, I mean, like 23 years ago, he wrote SBTC, I shall be the conqueror, and then he writes on the uh, ransom note. Now, you're suggesting that maybe he's in cahoots with somebody. Maybe they're going to split up that. Then he also evidently you knew something about there was some kind of a check stub on the desk in the house. He, he, he knows the stuff that was in the house. Right. You but he was, what I'm saying? he was obsessed with the case, and didn't he write something about it, and was right. following it obsessively? And oh, all yeah. Things. yeah so. And he was uh, exchanging emails with that guy, like, frantically, mm. feverishly, back and forth. And they had the guy on uh, King last night on his 18th uh, special panel, the version of uh, John Mark Carr, and the guy don't want to say anything. He says, we shouldn't be discussing this. And they very kept asking the question, well, we shouldn't be saying anything. Okay, thank you very much. And that was the end of that. It was kind of stupid. Five six seven oh five sixty. Pound 560 in the air. It's almost as stupid as all these people making a big fuss about Geraldo. You know, you ought to tell somebody on The Daily Show that nobody cares about Geraldo. He's so yesterday, man. You want to pass that message along? Okay, next time I see him, you know, we hang out. Cornball material. Sure. Nobody cares about Geraldo. I mean, do you care about Geraldo? 
You're kidding, right? No, no, I'm not kidding. I mean, I, I didn't, didn't hear about for all those itself. back even when, then. Even when people cared about him, you didn't care about him. Right. But when he was doing Jerry Springer-esque shows, I didn't care about him. Right. Although we did have that one clip, that great clip about, uh, in fact, I think that ties right in there with this uh, whole John Bonet business and John Mark Carr. Remember that dyke? Well, she wasn't a dyke. She just was a, uh, what did she call herself? Don't you remember she said yeah. that she'd like to dress up? She was a jeans and, I wonder um, if people are going to think I'm a dyke. I'm a dyke. No, Hillary, don't somewhere. worry. WQIM, hello, don't play it. QIM. That must be Geraldo on there. Sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Hello. Too late. WQIM, hello. Neil. Yes, sir. Hey, I was just wondering if uh, maybe George would like to join me and pose that grand flinch at Hooters today. WQIM, hello. Oh. <laughs> that must have been default calling from the Indians. Good morning, Neil. Yes, sir. Neil, yesterday George asked what I thought was an excellent question. He asked if any rock and roll time. bands have gotten actually gotten better as they got older. Josh asked that question. I and, what was oh, I'm sorry. Again? Okay, if what? If what? any bands had actually improved their quality as they got older, and I thought and thought, and I can only come up with one. But the reason I called is you're a music guy. I, I came up with the Beatles. Can you think of any that qualify for that? Gotten better with age. The 1910 Fruit Gum Company. No, come on, seriously. Uh, oh, I don't know. It's How about a tough Aerosmith? question. How about Aerosmith? It's a good question. You think they've gotten better with age? Oh, yeah. Well, they I mean, got sober. Maybe, huh? They got sober. Yeah, well, it's never, really it's never a good thing. They made better music when they were high, I thought. Yeah, you're right. I, I, but I the, Beatles, the Beatles qualify. How about the crazy elephant? How about the crazy elephant? <laughs> Get out of here with this crap. <laughs> I mean, what, what does that have to do with John Bonet and John Mark Carr Nothing. and SBTC, huh? Yesterday was the time to call TCOP? with that. How about TCOP? TCOP and MF MFSB. I got that somewhere in there. I bet you I got it in my iPod, man. Yeah, look what I got. The 1910 Fruit Gum Company. Close. Oh, no, it's the Crazy Elephant. Yes, it is. Love and I knew it. From the land of Georgia. Well, I, st I still got it, man. Trying to get rid of it, but I still got it. That crazy elephant. Yeah. Hey, Beast, how you doing there? Beast. Beast is in there, huh? Crazy elephant, yeah. He oh, said that the door oh. opened. How about Don't that? Don't get porky, Beast. Don't get porky. He'd be really upset if he found out that four of the last visits I made to Woodbine, I had 3000 on the line and then 2000 on the fifth time. But yesterday, I got off my machine and it paid uh, 3000 to some uh, raccoon guy. I actually had one positive experience. I went to the Hard Rock and played their fake video poker. Yeah. Uh, put in... Ten bucks, hit the button once, walked out with six hundred bucks, which for a schlepper like me is just I know it's nothing for you. But. Big deal. Big Matsia. As they say in Lisbon, Big Matsia, man. How's Ariel Sharon doing? Nineteen to get out of here. Get, get, quit uh, glomming onto our show, okay? Talk talk there. Who uh, are Now you're gonna be on with uh, Kenny Walker in that crowd and Bo? No. No. Well, where are you going to be? I'm uh, doing uh, updates with Hank. Oh, you're still going to be with the Humper. That's good. The two of you have got a lot in common, you know? <laughs> the gambling thing, the fat thing. How's Hank's weight? Now, where is he? Is he in Vegas or somewhere now, plunging his guts out? I think out? he might be in San Diego now. Doing what? I don't know. That's where he likes to hang out. San Diego? Yeah, you know, Del Mar. Oh, like I said, that's a track, plunging his guts out. That's what you go to the track for, sweetheart, to plunge your guts out. That's incredible to me. Right. Delmar with Trevor Dedman. There they go. In fact, I might. You inspired me. Maybe they got the replays from yesterday at Delmar on right now. Dropped in second grade. No, that's Sensor. Mohawk. Coming away in third. There's that's Bull those Brady buggy horses up. at Mohawk. The There's Mark McDonald. Boy, he's the best man next to a Brian Sears. He's damn good. Hey, let me tell you right now about your carpeting. I've been using dry concepts, and my, my old carpets look brand new for 21 long years. If I weren't so damn cheap, I'd probably go out and get new carpeting. But you know something? I don't have to especially now that the dogs are sleeping with the fishes. Because no matter how hopeless your carpets may look, Dry Concepts can take the oldest, schmutziest carpets and make them look and smell and feel just like brand new and lemony fresh. They've been doing it in South Florida for over 28 long years. In fact, when you call Dry Concepts, you really can clean today and entertain tonight. And your carpets stay cleaner longer, too, because there's no sticky residue left behind, which makes them last longer as well. Over 50,000 satisfied, happy customers love Dry Concepts, and I guarantee if you never used them yet, you will, too. And don't forget, they're also experts in water damage restoration. Good to keep in mind all during this long, terrifying hurricane season. 
Certified technicians get you out of the mold zone in minutes, not days. And dry concepts can get your home or business dry within 24 to 72 hours, guaranteed. They also have a state-of-the-art oriental rug cleaning plant, the only one in all of South Florida on-site, dedicated to keeping your expensive area rugs looking just like brand new. And they give you a written guaranteed price up front, no matter what it is, your carpeting, upholstery, drapery, any of these things, area rugs, they give you a written guaranteed price up front. No scams, no rip-offs, just a fabulous, unbeatable job every time. And Dave Broward of the Palm Beaches, call toll-free 1-800-248-5071. What is it again? 1-800-248-5071. We're on the Wicked Web. Log on to dryconcepts.com. This is Neil Rogers. This is 562 AM. They are a legendary cop duo dedicated to cleaning up the streets of L.A. The Jews have got to pin them down! No, 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 Rick, they're not Jews. The Jews are everywhere! we got to get some backup to take care of these Jews! No, 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 Rick, they're not Jews. It's two junkies and a dealer. Damn, Jew junkies! Lethal Weapon 5. Riggs, Riggs, you all right? You all right? Those three Jews are responsible for all the world's wars! Who, who are you talking about? We're not Jewish! Yeah! And I'm gay! You are? Yeah? Damn gay Jews! Lethal Weapon 5, starring Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, and the return of Joe Pesci as Leo Getz. Hey, Rex, right now! Hey, hey! Hey, Leo! Okay, okay, yeah? Stop, Joe! <laughs> you crazy! Yeah? Stop, Leo! Ooh, what did you just call me, Riggs? I called you, I called you! Oh. Cracker. Lethal Weapon 5. Now playing to ruin Mel Gibson's career. Probably that's before noon, and don't waste any time on that, although I think he's doing a good job himself. George went and saw Shakes on a Plane, and he yeah. said it sucked. Yes. But don't tell anybody that, because you're supposed to believe that it's the best thing. No, actually, they didn't do all that good at the box office this weekend. They got all that hype. In fact, I'll yeah. tell you how much hype a movie can get. I went and bought a bunch of these uh, DVDs over the weekend that I told you I watched Trials of Kissinger, Hunting of the President. Yep. And a couple of DVDs that I wouldn't even bother telling you about, about the lectures with Noam Chomsky speaking, oh, which oh. Uh, I don't expect our audience to watch that. No. But nevertheless. And uh, they, uh, the, the uh, guy at the counter, the uh, cashier, the kid reached over and he put another one in my bag. I thought, what the hell was that he just stuck in there, a freebie? And it's one of those preview DVDs for oh, Six yeah, on yeah. a Plane. Yeah, yeah. By the way, this is... Huh? I was going to say it is sad, but I, I, I think the movie, like, did great over the weekend, as far as money goes. Not, not what they were expecting, I don't think. I could be wrong about that, because that's not my area of expertise, but I think you're wrong. Let's double-check it. I'm checking it. Go to, the, go to the FUD report. She would know. Here's a fax. Thank you so much. Oh, and George has also added on to that. Oh, this no, no, I, I printed it up and sent it to you, because I couldn't find it in the King James Fundamentalist Bible. And so Chapter 8 of me. the Catholic or Latin Bible, Judges. Yeah. Judge not. Lest ye be a lady, John Mark Carr. He's, he, he's a lady with a pear-shaped ass. What's wrong right. with you guys? Not a surprise that he would be a cat. What did I tell you on the last Thursday? I can. I see a lady, I know one. That's a lady. Anyway, uh, chapter 8, verse 9, it says, He said therefore to them also, When I shall return a conqueror in peace. That's not it. Well, it's not an exact match, but... No, uh, you know. get out of here. Hey, this ain't SPDC. I will destroy this tower. Dixit, it's... Okay, uh, reverses square roll on your ass. Better watch that Latin. Yeah, Latin your ass. Well, what <laughs> is this? Well, I shall return a conqueror in peace. That's not SBTC. You just made that up. Susan Candiotti said that's where he got it. What? From the Bible? Yes. Well, this isn't the quote, though. Not exact quote, but... Uh, no. You know, it's modified. I shall be the conqueror. Well, and I'm glad you brought that up, though, because another thing that they're telling us about him, along with every other detail, like what he had for breakfast this morning, which I'm sure wasn't as good as dinner on the plane. But nevertheless, what we found out about him is that he was raised in a good religious uh, background, good religious family, man. What brand? What brand what? Wheaties? What brand of Christian? Oh, well, he became a Catholic. Didn't of he course. The, there you go. That's why he yeah. got the Latin Bible going. Well, pedophile and Catholic, and that sure. like uh, double talk? That's uh, the club for it. And then he was a teacher, and they don't know. What was that school in uh, Latin America, somewhere in Central America, Guatemala or Honduras, somewhere he was teaching very briefly? Maybe in Nicaragua. No, it was not Nicaragua. By the way, nice job on butchering all those people in Latin America, Henry Kissinger, and in uh, Cambodia, yeah. and in East Timor, and all around the world. No wonder the French want to fry you know, his He ass. talks just like Joe Lieberman, now that you mention it. You know, that's him. Yes, he does. Oh, that's Joe Lieberman. They had him on again. I forget when the hell I saw him. I wanted to vomit. 
Well, I think oh, well, he's uh, trying to butch up now in the war, you know. And I think that Don Rumsfeld ought to put his resignation. Such a whiny, wimpy piece of crap, man. So far bissing. I tell you, what did I tell you about when you, and you had your own experience thanks to your accountant there, your orthodox accountant? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you wrap them to fill in too tight, it's bad yeah. for the circulation. That's well, what happens when your brain shrivels how's up. How's God going to know you love him if I'm you sure don't that's not the only thing that shrivels up. Opposition among Americans, and there's nobody coming through with anything on this SBTC. Cause, and you want to know why? Because they don't know what the hell it means. Small balls take charge. <laughs> That's Clarence, I'm telling you, man. He's the one that killed John Bonet. He done it. He's killing us. By the way, 15.25 million for the movie. Well, it's nothing. What kind of ranking, though? It was number one, but, was, but that's nothing. Ain't nothing going on right now, either. Yeah, it had very little competition. It's not that big, man. Not that big in the movie either. Hope it bombs. Snakes Boy. on a Plane. Oh, come on. And isn't it interesting how Snakes on a Plane was released just coincidentally on Friday, just timing with this uh, whole thing, this terror alert we had in England. I'm not suggesting there's any connection, mind you. You know what it reminds me of? It's like Wagging the Dog. Remember when that movie came out? Sure. Wag the Dog? Yep. And remember how coincidental the timing was on that deal? Mm-hmm. I got news for you. When you watch this Clinton clip, in fact, even if you don't watch the rest of the movie, which I know you will, but anybody else, just watch the part where Clinton comes out after the initial screening of the movie and he talks to the audience. It, it's just fabulous stuff. It's really good. And you'll say, Pop had Clinton. Look what we got now, man. Look what we got now. Oh, yeah. U.S. President George W. Bush announced that the U.S. will not be leaving Iraq during his presidency yesterday in a spastic uh, spewing of venom. Either you say, yes, it's important and we stay there and get it done, or we leave, Bush argued. We're not leaving so long as I'm president. That would be a huge mistake. So much for all that troop withdrawal crap, huh? Yeah. He announced that the nation would be offering $230 million in aid to Lebanon. Yeah, we, we, we uh, gave the Israelis all those weapons so they could demolish your country. Now we're going to give you $230 million. See how many falafel stands that's going to build. Hey, we're all better, right? We're good. The president also called for a fast deployment of an international peacekeeping force. Not, of course, that we're going to be involved. You understand that. Right. Opposition among Americans to the war in Iraq has reached a new high with only about a third of respondents saying they favor it, according to a brand new poll released yesterday. There's that magical 33%. Yeah, it's very close to it. In fact, it's within the, air, you know, the uh, margin of error. 35% mm -hmm. of 1,033 adults. It's always 33, 35, 31. Right around... About 30, man. That. Just 35% of 1,000-plus adults polled said they favor the war in Iraq. 61% said they oppose it. The highest opposition noted in any CNN poll since the bloodbath began three years ago. The illegal invasion, occupation, slaughter, bloodbath, carnage, lunacy, insanity. Despite the rising opposition to the war, President Bush said the U.S. will not. I just said that. A bare majority, 51%, say they see Bush as a strong leader. But on most other attributes, he gets negative remarks. 54% do not consider him honest. 54% don't think he shares their values. And 58% say he does not inspire confidence. Oh, man, that's the understatement of the century. Bush's stand on the issues is also problematic with more than half. 57% of Americans saying they disagree with him on the issues they care about. Nice job in New Orleans, by the way. It's the one-year anniversary of Katrina. What a nice job. Well, of course, it's those dark folks. They vote Democrat too much anyway, you know. They don't have any homes. In fact, right. we ought to play that Clarence Frogman Henry. Ain't got no home. Coming right up. Oh, we don't have to play that because we got the, uh, what, what's the mo bit? I ain't never said do it. Ain't never said do it to the tune of ain't, uh, ain't got no home. That's the one. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> That's the one. Clarence Frogman Henry. What a, could he sing or what? No. He could bell out an ounce of sound, man. He was good. So that's the deal. Bush's tepid ratings do not bode well for his party's odds in the coming congressional elections. Asked which party's candidates they would vote for if the elections were held today, 52% said the Democrats, as weak and wimpy as they are. 43% said the GOP. There you go. But he's adamant, man. He's as stubborn as a mule and uh, got the same IQ. How many votes we got? We got way over 1,000. We got 1,046 pickup sticks. You ready for that? 1046. Who should the Democrats win uh, run for president in 2008? Al Gore, 286. Bring him back alive, baby, Al Gore. What about FDR? Let's go for five. I'll take Ike. Democrats. You know, it's interesting that, because um, you're not old enough because you weren't born yet, 
But before he ran in 52, the first time, the Democrats had made overtures to him, too, because he really wasn't affiliated. He was like, uh, you know, he's just a general. script, yeah. Yeah. Although if you watch Why We Fight, you'll like him oh, a lot more, man. Yes, he, you will. He, uh, he said it, he told it like it is. And especially considering the fact that he spent so much of his life in the military, to be the one that outed the military-industrial congressional complex. That's the important part, the uh, third part, the congressional complex. And he left, he left out in his speech the word congressional because he didn't want to offend his friends in Congress. But that's bad. what he was talking about, mm -hmm. the military-industrial congressional complex, which now, of course, we got the think tanks that they pointed out at the end of the movie to add to it. Yeah, tanks. The stink tanks. These lunatics, crazy, right wing, Richard Pearl, and uh, all these crazy, crazy, William Crystal, and uh, Paul Wolfowitz, of course, goes without saying. That will take Paul Wolfowitz and Henry Kissinger and fry him right on the CBS Evening News the night that the What's Her Name makes her debut, that bitch. Howard Dean, 162, I don't care, 135, Barack Obama, 104, Hillary, 93, John Edwards, 79, Joe Biden, he's just Biden his time, 70, he talks through his ass. He's very articulate, very glib, but he talks a lot of crap. Elliot Spitzer, there's the man, only 36. Who's that, they're saying? Who that? Uh, I hate this poll, only 31, only 2.9%. They love it. Russ Feingold, he passed John Kerry like he was laying out, prone position. 27 for Russ and 23. It's only, it's scary, John Kerry, only 23 votes, 2.1% out of 1,048. Pretty this weak, John. is Neil Rogers. Herman Munster, the embarrassed. This is 560 QAM. Oh, this is Pope John Paul Lind. And if you ask me, the only thing more fun than playing grab ass with a Swiss guy is the Neil Rogers 12 to 1 hour. Oh. It was an arch rivalry that became a secret. Listen, Joker, in the light of the bad cave, your green hair really sets off your purple suit. It's actually plum, but thank you, Cape Crusader. Batman Mountain, with Christian Bale as Batman and Heath Ledger as the Joker. I wish I knew how to quit you, Joker. I wish I knew how to get that utility belt off. Stately Wayne Manor just got a makeover. Holy queer eye, Batman. You and the Joker sure know how to make time pass down here in the Batcave. Well, Robin, um, uh, we're just spilling. Lunking buddies. <laughs> right, Joker? Don't worry, Boy Wonder. There's enough room on that bat pole for both of us. <laughs> Batman Mountain. You can fight crime, but you can't fight your true identity. Let's send the Batmobile in the Gotham Pride Parade. You know, any network that would put Richard Quest and Rick Sanchez on the air on the same day, that tells you how serious they are about wow. news. Okay. Heavy. CNN, certainly not News Network. You guys suck. Although we do like uh, Jeffrey Tubin a lot now and uh, Susan Candiotti. She's our good pal. She's our bud. Five, six, seven, nobody with SBTC yet. I'll tell you one person that you're going to gain tremendous respect if you don't have already. And I'm just talking to you because you're the only one that's going to watch the movie. Don't right. give these two movies to Josh because he might learn something. He won't watch them. Would you watch these? He watched Why We Fight. Oh, it's just going to piss me off, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess so. That's all I get out of them. <laughs> all angered up. No, but man, listen, you will learn something in both of these, I'm telling you. But anyway, I was okay. about to talk about Susan McDougall. Okay. She had a humongous pair, man. This yes, lady, she did. in spite of her husband, who was a, a crazy person, not literally and figuratively, and just caved in, of course, easily. But she just uh, told him, no way, Jose, I'm not going to back up any stories about Clinton or anybody else. And if you want to throw my ass in jail, go right ahead. And she just let them run her ass through the ringer mm -hmm. and stood one of the few people in history I can think of who actually uh, stood up for anything other than the uh, uh, prayers at the assembly in school and the national anthem at the ball game, and, of course, the invocation at the football game. In Jesus' name, amen. Are they still doing that crap? I, I don't it, know. It goes past me. I, I've never heard it. But well, the Dolphins are one of the few. Didn't we go through this last yes, year? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And, of course, wrong, I was right as hey. usual, and you guys uh, the, were full of crap. Try to tell me that the Dolphins don't have the invocation anymore, and leave it to the Humper had to call in <laughs> and straight it out and said that they're one of a couple of teams that, that still funny. do that crap and make the people stand up uh, for some kind of stupid ass uh, prayer before the ball game. Of course, the Dolphins they could use it, you know what I mean? But anyway, Susan McDougall is great, and this book, this film is great. The Hunting of the President, the ten-year campaign to destroy Bill Clinton, almost as good though as the Trials of Henry Kissinger. That that one, if you want to get angry, if you want to be foaming at the mouth, that'll make you just spit blood. I don't know. Oh, and speaking of spitting blood. That's good, thank you. Oh, good God. Richard Quest. How, do they have any, are they hearing impaired over there at CN and visually impaired with his donkey teeth and that heavy, phony British accent and the donkey teeth? He is disgusting. He makes you want to commit sausages or murder. 
SBTC. You notice the original uh, audience we got? Uh, they couldn't come up with it if, uh, oh, for please. love or money. Even I came up with small balls take charge. I like that. Isn't that good? That is good. What else could it be? Oh, I could come up with some stuff. Maybe John Bonet wrote or uh, what Patsy wrote it. Some That's bitch it. took the child. There you go. When she thought Patsy, uh, John Bonet was kidnapped. Some, some bitch, bitch. Some bastard took child. Some bitch. That could be it. WQAM, hello. Hey. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, this, uh, it's funny that you were talking about the anniversary of Katrina. Yeah. Yesterday on HBO, they were showing, I just tuned it in. I just tuned in. I don't know if anybody called you and talked about it. No. When the levees broke, it's by uh, Spike Lee. I, I saw the last half hour. Yeah. I was oh, telling you about it. It was, it, was, it was very interesting, you know, and then you just. Yes, it was. You see Bush talk about, Brownie, you're doing a good job, Brownie. Right. <laughs> I'm like, see, how stupid can you be to vote for somebody like that? Well, I got news for him, man. Anybody that votes for him ought to be in federal prison right now. Let the Susan McDougals of the world out and stick their ass well, in there is what I say. Well, Neil, laugh and over the sucky. What did he say? And over the sucky. Oh. Speak in English, Pally. I can't understand a damn thing you're saying. Speak in English. Get some tutoring. Go see that movie, My Tutor, with, uh, what's, her, what's his name, Matt LaPanzi. Clown. WQAM, hello. Whatever happened to Olivia Newton-John's boyfriend? Hey, Neil. Yes, sir. Glad you're talking about her, Pat. Well, he disappeared fast, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. WQAM, hello. Hi, Ron. Jim. WQAM, hello. You know George also. <laughs> well, one quick uh, finger mm -hmm. took care of all of those. Isn't that good? Excellent. I know, I've got it figured out. Mary L Marty Luster, and this isn't even lackluster, he uh, represented the 125th District, which includes Ithaca, New York, as a Democrat, and the New York State Assembly from 88 to 2002. A New York Assemblyman, he writes in the Ithaca Journal, of all places, uncovering the Clinton disappointment, it's about swillery. Marty Luster, as in Hillary is a little lack, Luster. He says, in 2000, I spent many evenings and some very cold days campaigning for Hillary Clinton's election to the U.S. Senate. I believe then as I believe now. Well, that line sounds familiar that Senator Clinton had the makings of greatness. I carefully followed Senator Clinton's performance in the Senate, and during her first several years, enjoyed watching her play the expected role of a quiet freshman. Her votes were in keeping with her campaign promises, and her expectations for her political future were high. However, as, well, as those of us who study history and politics know, events beyond our control often have a way of disrupting carefully planned agendas and blurring even the clearest of visions. Those events often call for the abandonment of otherwise appropriate tentative and cautious approaches and instead require bold and clear leadership. It is here that Senator Clinton has disappointed us. Absolutely correct, sir. Prime example of Senator Clinton's failure to lead are her actions with regard to the Iraq war. Instead of questioning the administration's discovery of the axis of evil and the president's pre-established plan to invade a country with whom we were at peace to further his scheme of regime change in Iraq, Senator Clinton, along with most of the Congress, speedily and without investigation of the facts, advocated its responsibility under the Constitution and granted broad authority to the executive to commence and wage war. In fact, you know, the one scene that, I, that stands out more than anything else in uh, Why We Fight is Bobby Byrd standing there in an almost empty Senate chamber talking about the strange and eerie silence as we were about to embark on this lunacy, this madness. He yep. said you could hear a pin drop, and you could. I like that guy. Bobby Byrd? That old bird. To this day, the senator insists that knowing what we know now, there were no WMDs, no connection between 9-11 and Saddam, no purchase of uranium by Iraq from Niger, no post-invasion plan, insufficient troop deployment, manipulation of intelligence findings to support the war, a total lack of attention to our understanding of the religious and political situation in Iraq, and a childlike belief that there would be insignificant opposition in Iraq to our presence that more than 2,600 American soldiers have died in this war, and that Iraqis are dying at the rate of 100 a day. That's one World Trade Center death toll every month. And that our effort has cost us over $300 billion, and that there's no end in sight, that she still would have voted to authorize the invasion. Instead of the bold leadership required by the president's insane compulsion to invade Iraq, Senator Clinton took the easy way out. Instead of using those enormous talents she demonstrated as First Lady and on the campaign trail, she followed the herd. That's what I heard. Unfortunately, outside events once again have put the senator to the test, and again, in my opinion, she has come up wanting. 
As a Jew, Israel is very dear and important to me. Without question, the state of Israel has the right to exist and defend itself. Without question, Hezbollah has acted without provocation and poses a threat to Jewish and Arab Israelis alike. However, as I expect my country, the U.S., to demonstrate leadership in the world through policies that create and maintain peace and assist in improving the quality of life for people around the globe, so too do I expect the nation that symbolizes my heritage, Israel, to lead by example, to love peace, to respect human life, and when armed defense becomes necessary, to undertake that task with caution, care, and in doses measure to meet the need. We expect more from those we love, and that goes for nations as well as individuals. When the latest hostilities broke out in northern Israel and southern Lebanon, I hoped that Senator Clinton would speak out for calm, for forbearance, and for caution. Instead, she said she supported whatever steps are necessary to defend Israel. We will stand with Israel because Israel is standing for American values as well as Israeli ones, she ironically added. Instead of using her pulpit to call for an immediate ceasefire, she once again fell in lockstep with the Bush administration and did the politically expedient thing of backing both the U.S. and Israeli policy of using superior military force in a reckless fashion that has killed hundreds of innocent Lebanese civilians, over a thousand it is, weakened the Lebanese, over 1,300, weakened the Lebanese government and destroyed the infrastructure of that nation beyond repair in the lifetime of many people who live there. Jonathan Tassini is running against Senator Clinton in the Democratic primary. He has written eloquently about Israel and the current war. Tassini, a Jew whose father fought in the Haganah, the Israeli underground, in the War of Independence and lived in Israel for seven years and still has extensive family there, has said, A true friend of Israel, not someone who simply seeks votes, would understand that employing collective punishment against people in Lebanon only embitters a population, possibly for generations, and that even a short-term military victory will be empty if it leaves behind a shattered country. For these and similar comments, Tassini has been vilified by the Clinton campaign and her supporters with false accusations that he labeled Israel as a terrorist state and that his comments are beyond the pale. I urge readers to examine his statement, it's got a link to it, and compare his depth of understanding and his leadership to the shallow and predictable comments of Senator Clinton. Hillary Clinton still has the makings of greatness. Because of that, we expect more from her than we've received. Well, what an understatement that is. You suck, Hillary. Yeah. Bitch. SBTC. Some bitch, uh... Took Clinton. Hey, there you go. I like that. That's not very good. I still like small balls take charge. That's the Clarence Darrow story. Don't forget our new lineup starts next Monday, August 28th. Oh! That's the end of the world in the Islamic calendar, isn't it? August 28th. End of August. So. That's the end of Geldy, I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's the end of uh, Hank in the Morning. All of these things. Right. And a bunch of other stuff. Maybe that's the end of our wallowing in ones and twos the rest of the day. And maybe we have a good lead and we can get those nines and tens again that we used to have. Remember those days? Oh, yeah. Now Long time ago. Twelve minutes past noon at 560 WQAM. We got Curtis Stevenson at two. There's a good guy for you. Good old Adelaide Stevenson, man. Bald head, divorced. Couldn't win a fixed election. Well, he was against Ike, man. How could you, how could you beat a war hero, huh? Plus, what? he was an egghead. Americans don't like eggheads. They don't like intellectuals. They like, uh, down, the they like guys that are like Hamish, man. Like Jimmy Carter. Down home folk, you know. Jim Mandage, 4 to 6.30. Marlins on deck at 6.30. Marlins and the Washington Nats, 7.05. Man, you could hear, you, you'd be able to uh, have your own section in that game. And Eddie Kay follows the baseball. In fact, if you took the wins that the Marlins have against the Washington Nats and the Pittsburgh Pirates out of the standings, the Marlins would be 60 games under 500. They're pretty damn close to it. Am I right, Josh? 60 games under? Right. If you took away the games that they've beaten Washington and Pittsburgh. Oh, yes, yes. They wouldn't be very They'd good. be, as they say in Finland, off Taurus. 12-13 at 5.60 WQAM. You know, South Florida's got a lot of shoe stores, and there are a lot of them that come and go, but there's one that's been there for years and years because they offer you folks an unbeatable combination all the time. Best selection of all the top brands like Floor Shine, Echo, Mephisto, Rockport, Hush Puppies, New Balance. Unbeatable prices all the time, including specials every week. And friendly personal service to make sure your Tootsies get a perfect fit for your feet every time. Of course, I'm talking about Brandy's. Brandy's is the largest independent shoe retailer in all of South Florida with unbeatable selection and value. In fact, go stop and see our friend Arnie at Brandy's. who will make sure every time you get the right fitting shoes for your feet at the right price, too. you find Brandy's at 1290 North Federal Highway in Pompano Beach, right between Atlantic and Copas on the east side. And Brandy's is open every day of the week for your shopping and dancing pleasure, Monday through Saturday till 9 and every Sunday till 5. A lot of dancing going on these days. You notice that? And this week is a great time to buy... Bell South Small Business simplifies your voice, data, and network experience so you can stay focused on your business. So when you're... So come in and save a ton of cash and get your feet all all gussied up nice. Or do your shoe shopping right on their website at Brandy's Shoes. It's too young. Mr. Gore, how you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. You're thinking of running for president in 2008, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh... And Earth to L. 
I am excited and stimulating. Oh, you think so? Hmm. Al, have you ever drinking Jägermeister? Oh, absolutely. Really? And what happened? I began to see the future. Oh, yeah? Did you see me running you over in the parking lot? Yeah. How dare they drag the good name of the United States of America through the mud of Saddam Hussein's torture prison? You know, I think maybe that's a good poll for you one day. Since yeah. we got Gore screaming on there, and we got Howie mm -hmm. Dean ah! screaming. That would be a good poll. Uh, who's the biggest screamer of them all? That John Carr Gore, guy. Howard Dean, John Mark Carr, I got him on there. Freaky Carlos, right? Okay. Just, just a suggestion. I'm not trying to like influence uh, uh, you know, your poll material. Biggest screamer of them all. Senator Chuck Hagel says the GOP has lost its way. Rhymes with gay. How do you like that? Republicans have lost their way when it comes to many core GOP principles and may be in jeopardy uh, heading into the fall election. Senator Chuck Hagel, Republican Nebraska, says a possible presidential candidate in 2008. Hagel said Sunday the GOP today is a very different party from the one when he first voted Republican. First time I voted was in 1968 on top of a tank in the Mekong Delta, said Hagel, a Vietnam veteran. Well, yeah, and he's proud of that. I voted a straight Republican ticket. That means he voted for Nixon. The reason I did is because I believe in the Republican philosophy of governance. It's not what it used to be. I don't think it's the same today. Oh, yeah, good old Tricky Dick. He's proud of that? Wouldn't How come be? it was that Haldeman and Mitchell and Ehrlichman and Dean and uh, Chuck Colson all went to jail, but somehow Henry Kissinger, who I think is Drew Lieberman with glasses on, how come Henry Kissinger walks free today, even though he's wanted for a murder all over the, uh, France, uh, Chile, all over the world? He has vase. He must have vase. Because every time I see him, I say, oy vey. Hegel asked, where is the fiscal responsibility of the party I joined in 68? Where is the international engagement of the party I joined? Fair, free trade, individual responsibility, not building a bigger government, but building a smaller government. Iran Contra with Reagan and all these other good right-wingers. His frustration does not lead him to think Democrats offer a better alternative. Wait, wait till you see the part where Nixon and Kissinger are doing their thing to, to kidnap and eventually was assassinated, the, the head of the Chilean army. Mm-hmm. Because they had to get rid of him uh, before they could get to Allende. And they eventually did. And, of course, uh, yeah. it took a while. Allende got elected. But uh, bada bing, there he went. You won't see him no more. Bye-bye, Salvador. Hegel hasn't decided whether he'll run as president in 2008. He says, I think Republicans are going to be in some jeopardy for and will be held accountable for losing their way. How do you like that? Mm -hmm. Republicans have lost their way. How about their Kurds? That, too. Kurds are having problems, too, man, especially with those Turks. North American Union threatens U.S. sovereignty. Wait, when you hear this, I don't even know if I should read this. Uh, Lou Dobbs told us all about it, so why don't you? What? That North American Union. Oh, did it? Was he hocking about it? Well, I'm sure Oh, he was. jumping up and down. That's right. That's right in his uh, bailiwick. Show enough. Ever buy Airwick? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, you have. I don't buy that stuff, I guess. No, but, but back in the day when Eric used to be that green, nasty, green, slimy stuff. Oh, yeah, pick, yeah. And you'd open the bottle, you'd lift the wick up, and, and sure. it, would, it would release the stench into your, uh, oh, my God. Uh -huh. At least Eric now makes freshener that, like, smells good, stinks good, you know. Uh-huh. Like an you air freshener stink, it may stink good. That old Airwick with that, I remember that as a child, before your time, I'm sure. I'm sure some of the old farts, I'm sure that no, chicken remember remembers it. It had, like, a jelly Airwick. inside of there. Huh? It had, like, a jelly in there. No, it did not. No, that's the new Airwick. That's the thing you lift up in the gen. Oh, okay. that's, you're, that's oh you're talking about the stuff with like, the man. cloth thing in there? I'm talking about my generation. Oh, yeah, that's for old timers. <laughs> talking about my generation, man. The old farts. Can I read this or not? Go for it's it. It's written by Alan Karuba, who would play a hell of a Karuba in human events. He says the problem with the Bush administration is that not enough of its officials have read the U.S. Constitution. Take, for example, Section 2 of Article 2. When dealing with foreign nations, it says the President shall have the power, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the Senate present concur. So why is President Bush and his administration seeking to establish a North American Union that would, in effect, abolish the borders between Canada, Mexico, and the USA? Moreover, it would involve our government in so many common regulatory mandates with these two nations as to render the sovereignty of the U.S. a memory of what national self-governance is supposed to be. The name of this effort is called the Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America, SPP. Not SBTC, but SPP. Oh, I can't say PP. Sorry, Joyce. And guess what? It hasn't been submitted to the Senate for its oversight or concurrence because 
By some magic of governmental definition, it is not a treaty. Instead, its administration is buried in the bowels of the Commerce Department. It does have, however, the blessing of the political and corporate elites of all three nations. A visit to the SPP website says it was launched in March of 2005 as a trilateral effort to increase security and enhance prosperity among the U.S., Canada, and Mexico through greater cooperation and information sharing. It is an attack on American sovereignty. In the smoothest and most soothing writing you'll find anywhere, the website spells out the wonders of SPP. They include the North American Competitiveness Council, the North American Energy Security Initiative, the North American Energy Management Plan, and plans for a smart, secure border. And right now, there are working groups whose purpose is to improve productivity, reduce the cost of trade, and enhance the quality of life. And if you like snake oil, permit SPP to sell it to you by the barrel, but the boxcar and by the tanker as well. The SPP didn't start out as an idea. The presidents of the three nations started kicking around March 23, 2005 in Waco, Texas, but it became the official policy of the U.S. at a special summit convened by Bush and joined by then-Mexican President Vicente Fox and Canadian Prime Minister Paul Martin. Like so many really bad foreign policy concepts, SPP owes its origins to the Council on Foreign Relations, the unctuous CFR, in this case, CFR's Task Force on North America. Its report, Building a North American Community, envisions the elimination of U.S. borders in just five years. Like termites eating away at the sovereignty of the U.S., this grandiose scheme is a major threat to American security and prosperity. The Marxist, the Marxist major domo of this task force is Professor Robert Pastor, who told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the best way to secure the U.S. today is not at our two borders with Mexico and Canada, but at the borders of North America as a whole. Oh, yeah? This surely explains why Mexico is doing such a great job of stopping the drug smugglers or the one million Mexicans who each year consider the U.S. border a mere fiction in their pursuit of jobs President Bush keeps telling us Americans won't take. This is pure bunk and dangerous bunk at that. I bet you Lou Dobbs was foaming at the mouth over that. You should have seen him. Alan Karuba goes on to say, I have many Canadian friends, but it seems to me that Canada took too long to discover it had some fanatical Muslim in its midst who were plotting terrible things. Frankly, I want to cooperate. I want us to cooperate against the common enemy, but I don't want to place the responsibility for America's security in anyone's hands but our own. A North America union promises not only security, says SPP, but prosperity, too. Without SPP, however, the three nations already do more than $800 billion in trilateral trade. Surely the U.S. needs Mexico's help to improve our economy? As the economist Robert Samuelson noticed in the June column, the subtext for the U.S. immigration debate is Mexico. Why doesn't its economy grow faster, creating more jobs and higher living standards? The answer that had to do uh, to that has something to do with the economic, cor the endemic corruption that infests all levels of Mexico's governmental and business sectors. Something is very wrong when Mexico's economy must literally depend on the billions its illegal aliens sent home from the U.S. Eh? Kind of sounds like the everything that happens in Sicily and in most of Italy. Unbelievable. Everything, even, even the soccer games are fixed. Hmm. How do you like that? I don't. I don't want to cast no aspersions on no Siciliani, but the fact of the matter is, even, even their noses are crooked. How do you like that? Wow. You think it's just a coincidence? Now that you mention it. Yeah, just stop and think about it, okay? Talk about your nose out of joint. Makes me think of my old good friend, Meyer Lansky, on the beach. <laughs> on the streets of Henley Jewish Miami Beach, Lansky became an elder statesman, a living legend. The most pious Jews in the world in Miami Beach were the holiest people to whom God is everything. Even God wasn't close to Maya Lansky. As soon as they saw Maya Lansky, forget about God, this was God. They used to worship him, follow him, look at him. If he walked down the street, they would talk about how slow he walked, how fast. Did he have a dog, a cow, a horse? This is Neil Rogers. This is 560 QAM. Oh.
27 till uh, 1 o'clock. Dumber than a box of rocks. That's your president. By the way, I see that part two of the um, uh, uh, Spike Lee thing on Katrina is on tonight. Okay. I just mentioned that in passing. Would you tell me about that before the, the show? The, and I was, the good I'm, news is you don't yes. really see him, at least I didn't. It's just interviews with people and clips of the news and the events that took place. And a lot I of prefer stuff. Spike Jones myself. And a lot of things that the news did not show you because it was too unsavory, people using language, carcasses rotting, maggots okay, coming out of their eyes. Like of Spike Jones and Pinky Lee, Spike Lee? Has their, it's their love child. Lee. Anyway, uh, Spike Lee presents a four-hour chronicle recounting, and that's what the caller was talking about before we, until he started talking mumbo-jumbo, uh, about Katrina. Last night was Acts 1 and 2, and Acts 3 and 4, 9 o'clock tonight, HB, HBO. Oh. Okay? Okay. Speaking of tremendous shows that are going to be uh, coming on your TV very, very soon, and I say that very, very sarcastically, an upcoming television special produced by a Christian broadcaster, one of the worst hate mongers in the history of the human race, that features conservative pundit Ann Coulter, who may be the worst hate monger, links Charles Darwin to Adolf Hitler. Raw story has learned. You see this? No. Darwin's deadly legacy, the chilling impact of Darwin's theory of evolution, coming this weekend to a pathetic TV channel near you. Author and Christian broadcaster Dr. G. Uh, D. James Kennedy connects the dots between Charles Darwin, Adolf Hitler, and Darwin's deadly legacy, a groundbreaking inquiry into Darwin's chilling social impact, announces a press release issued by the Coral Ridge Ministries, where they have that big, big, gaudy uh, edifice almost to the sky. You've driven by it many a time, I'm sure. I don't think I have, but I've seen it on TV. Get out of here. I'm, all right, bye. I'm going to go eat some lunch. You never drove by the Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church? I don't, I don't know where it is. I might have. It goes 80 million miles up into the sky, makes the CN Tower look like a, yeah. like a pup tent. I've seen pictures of it. The new television documentary. You better get yourself uh, into other parts of Broward beside Hollywood. I mean, I've Hollywood a lot of places that sound like that. I don't know. I don't Hollywood pay is attention. for old farts. Yeah, well, I'm on my way. Get up there toward uh, Pompano. <laughs> oh, yeah, where all the youngsters. Where the young people live. Hey, the ones between that's right. What? That's right. That's where Josh lives. I thought you would. Now, let's see. We can't keep track of you anyway. You're still living with your boyfriend? What's wrong Josh, with Josh, he's got a male roommate. Now, the good news is... A lot of Josh people have roommates, his, buddy. Josh and his male roommate live in separate... They sleep in separate bedrooms. They yeah. don't have that's, twin beds. Huh? No. That's how, that's how normal people do it. As opposed to Sam and Dean in the uh, that horrible show, the uh, Supernaturals. Jane I got Dean. news for you. If, if, they were, if they wanted to bunk out here, they could sleep in their own bed. In my, they could sleep on the floor... Both of them. In the tub. In the tub. Rub-a-dub-dub. Can I get back to this thing? Well, I don't want to hear about Josh and his boyfriend. The new television documentary airs, although Josh was telling me about it, he watched the, some of the Blue Jay game. And, you know, it's interesting. But, of course, to show you, I couldn't care less about the Blue Jays, even though you know, I'm here most of the time, because I, I don't care about baseball. But when something is on HD, you do watch it, even though ordinarily you might not. Am I right? Yes. And it's, just, it's just amazing. When something is on in high definition... You, you, you're glued to it. And, and then every now and then you'll accidentally find something. For example, they had a really interesting show a couple of nights ago about Niagara Falls and about these guys that tried to make this uh, makeshift camera that was going like, you know, to go over the falls. And, and, and the whole thing was just amazing. You had to be there. Though. And it was in HD. And you felt like you were going right off the edge right after losing your Rancid Falls view. Yeah, Discovery HD is probably the best channel. Yeah, a- absolutely. And then uh, PBS, too. Absolutely. It's got some good crap. If it's in HD, man, I'm there. Although I wish I'd have been there a little bit later on to see the big contretemps between. I wish I'd have seen when he had to yank the ball out of uh, Tilly's hand, Lily, Eli Lily. I wonder if uh, I wonder if Ted Lily's got a pear-shaped ass. You know, that would that would tell us a lot about why he's so bad and can't get anybody out. He really stinks. And nice going on that fifty-five million dollars for AJ Burnett. Nice going there, Blue Jays. You guys are idiots. Author and Christian broadcaster Dr. D. James Kennedy, a real, real evil person, an evil doer. Connects the dots between Charles Darwin and Adolf Hitler and Darwin's deadly legacy. A groundbreaking inquiry into Darwin's chilling social impact announces a press release issued by Coral Ridge Ministries. The new TV documentary airs nationwide this weekend, August 26th and 27th, on the Coral Ridge Hour. To put it simply, no Darwin, no Hitler, says Dr. Kennedy. 
Hitler tried to speed up evolution to help it along, and millions suffered and died in unspeakable ways because of it. Let me put it this way to you, Dr. Kennedy. No Dr. Kennedy, no James Dobson, no Jerry Falwell, no Pat Robertson, no religious nuts, no hate and murder in the world. Huh. Fourteen scholars, scientists, and no pope. Fourteen scholars, scientists, and authors featured on the show outline the grim consequences of Darwin's theory of evolution and show how his theory fueled Hitler's ovens, according to the press release. I bet you're just going to be glued to that, aren't you? Sure. Other participants include, from Darwin to Hitler, author in California State University, modern European history professor Richard Weikert, along with Michael Behe, who wrote Darwin's Black Box, and is a prominently cited source against evolution in Coulter's latest book. Of course, she's living proof that evolution is, doesn't exist. In a recent study, Media Matters argued that Coulter's end notes were rife with distortions and falsehoods. Well, that's part of her, spe that's her sure. speciality. That's her part and parcel. Right. This show basically is about the social effects of Darwinism and shows this idea, which is scientifically bankrupt, has probably been responsible for more bloodshed than anything else in the history of humanity. One of the show's producers, Jerry Newcomb, told WorldNet Daily. Uh, By the way, how did you like in um, Why We Fight, the thing about Truman, and the fact that he, yeah. he dropped the nukes on the Japs because he wanted to and he wanted to scare Stalin? Sure, it worked. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it worked like a charm. clip from the special can be seen at this link. It's got a link to it. We keep hearing about gaps in the theory of evolution, Coder says in the clip. The whole theory is a gap. Yeah. And guess what you are, Ann? Rhymes with gap. Crap. That's what yeah. you are. See, I think you're wrong, because I think in the future there won't be two genders, and she's living proof. Oh, she's the old gender bender. She's the, she's the truth forward, bender yeah. and the gender bender. In fact, just why don't you just bend over so we can all stick our feet where the moon don't shine. Or just stick some moonshine up in there. Couldn't hurt. Ever see her and uh, John Mark Carr together? Same person. Oh, good point. He's and way more feminine. She's got, she's got a better attitude. That's right. By far. Coulter carries on the theme from her best-selling book released in June on 6606, which attacks liberalism as a godless religion. I think Darwinism is popular as a story because it allows atheists not to have to explain why we're here, Coulter says in the special. There's no such thing as morality. There's no such thing as our consciousness of our own morality. We're about one step above a porpoise, Coulter adds, although many of them seem to believe we're below a porpoise because we have nukes and we pollute and we hate crimes and don't recycle. We have hate crimes. Yeah, I'd say we're several steps below a porpoise, and I'm saying that on porpoise. Ooh. How about below a dolphin? Coulter has been widely criticized for her attacks on... Uh, Scoran used to be into that. Dolphins? Being below dolphins. Coulter has been widely criticized for her attacks on Darwin's theory of evolution, which he called one notch about Scientology and scientific rigor in her book. What's annoying about Coulter is that she insistently demands evidence for evolution, none of which she'll ever accept, but requires not a shred of evidence for her alternative hypothesis, wrote Professor Jerry Coyne from the University of Chicago's Department of Ecology and Evolution in a recent book review. According to the ministry's website, the Coral Ridge Hour airs on more than 400 stations, four cable networks, and to 165 nations on the Armed Forces Network, and is the third most widely syndicated weekly Christian television program. The show also runs on some Fox-owned TV stations as a paid program. Christian, uh, Coral Ridge Ministries' threefold mission is to evangelize, nurture Christian growth and biblical instruction, and reform American culture by applying the truth of Scripture to all life, including civic affairs, reads the About page at the ministry's website. I guess they left out the part about spreading hate and uh, intolerance. Right. Which they do best. That, that's their speciality, man. Spreading hate and intolerance. And, of course, uh, being in bed with a sick bitch like that, like her. And, of course, isn't it interesting that she and Miss Fudge are best of buddies? I wonder what position Lynn Samuels takes in that uh, whole deal, huh? Pivot. She's the pivot man. Is she the pivot guy? Kenneth Mas Macho, baby. Janet Reno, Lynn Samuels, and Co Man Coulter. Who am I leaving out? I leave out Janet Reno? John Carr. John, oh, he's not even in the, he's not in the <laughs> mix, as they say. He's not even in the mix. In fact, i got news for you. Even Tom Mix was more macho than he was. 1242 at 560 WQAM. No, nobody's got the SBTC, man. Just the usual bunch of assorted nuts no. today, huh? You must have been having a really hell of a good summer on these summer. Oh, yes, yeah, spectacular. Hey, let me tell you, going back to school can be a little rough on the kids, and a good night's sleep is critical for the development of healthy minds or even marginal minds. If your kids are having trouble adjusting to school night bedtime, it just might be that they're sleeping on a lousy mattress, man. They're tossing and turning and humping and bumping. Anyway, call Dial a Mattress toll free at 1 800 Mattress. Dial a Mattress can recommend a mattress for kids of any age. Have a new bed delivered the date and time you choose, seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Just give Dial a Mattress any two hour window and they'll deliver your mattress even the same day that you call, like noon to two, one to three, whatever it's convenient when your ass is going to be home and they show up on time. Call 1 800 Mattress right now and get the best selection at the best unbeatable prices of Sealy, Serta, Simmons, King Coral, tempur and Stearns, and Foster. I've been using them for years. It's the easiest and the smartest piece of shopping. No wasting expensive gas. No uh, getting all schlepped 
worked up to a, uh, a frantic uh, frenzy in a tremendous heat and humidity. All you do is sit there on your fat ass and make one easy call. Or you can go online, too, and check it all out at mattress.com. Better yet, pick up the phone right now. Call Dial a Mattress. You can be sleeping on that new bed as soon as tonight. Call 1-800-MATTRESS, M-A-T-T-R-E-S. Leave off the last S because it stands for Sales Hole Sarner. This is Neil Rogers. <laughs> this is 560 QAM. At my junior, honey. We are the new Christianity. George Bush is our Christ and King. We are a land of ignorant mugwumps. Praise to the our prince of dumbness. New sacrifice we must ingest. The body and blood of Falwell's flesh. Bush is Lord and giver of life. Hosanna in the highest. Bushes, Lord and giver of life, was out in the highest, was out in the highest, was out in the highest. Blessed is the bush of dumbness, worship bush or die, worship bush or die, worship bush or die. Oh, okay. Cup 48, all I can say is... I'm dying over here. How's that poll coming? Who should the Democrats run for president in 2008? I realize two years, how are we going to survive two years? I don't know. Carefully. Man. Oh, and here's the big news. Here's the bulletin. This whole timeline. John Mark Carr in court for exposition hearing like in there's, L.A. There's something missing, so the prosecutor in Boulder must have something up her sleeve. She must have a real ace card to play. What do you think? Yeah, I think that what I happened that here her ace. is that somebody in the media maybe. that this investigation was going on. I think that the Boulder DA's office was gathering its evidence. They were gathering up Mr. Carr. They were getting ready to... Uh, is that like gathering chestnuts? ...and do it the way most investigations are done. Is just gathering nuts. ...media scrutiny. Someone tipped the media, and then there was a hastily called press conference. Small balls take charge. This was not a press conference that said, we got our yeah. man. This was a press conference that said, hang on, we've issued the arrest warrant because the guy... Yeah, I don't think he needs a sex change operation. Now, didn't I tell you that the first time I seen him there on the yeah, team? Yes, you did. On the... You can spot him. Jew! I, no, I said, I don't think he's got a... I don't know how they got the three kids. Oh, and also, how come we're not hearing more about the delivery of the twins who died at birth? you know who delivered the twins? No. UPS? He did. Oh. Oh. And they died at birth. I see. Uh-huh. Hmm. And we're hearing very little about that, but I'm sure we'll hear lots more, more than you could ever imagine, more than you could ever want, more than anybody could ever want, because this is Norm Early now. If somebody tipped off... I wonder if he's kind to Early win. Uh, it's impossible at this point to conduct the investigation in a clandestine fashion. Uh, to assume that she would not have arrested the man but... For 1,151 votes on the poll. What does this poll have to do with John Bonet and John Mark Carr and uh, Patsy and uh, don't be a Patsy man like Lee Harvey Oswald? Just a passy. Right. Who should the Democrats run in 2008? Not who do you like, not who can win, but who should they run, which I guess means who could win. Al Gore, 319, winning in a landslide. Howard Dean, 171. A couple of screamers. I don't care, 139. 12% of you don't care enough to send your very best. Well, to you, okay? Just like I said to the beast. Barack Obama, 117. Hillary, 105. By the way, that's a raspberry in case you're not that's up on right. your fruits. As opposed to a strawberry. Right. Hillary, 105, as opposed to a poisonberry. <laughs> John Edwards, 88. Joe Biden, 74. Russ Feingold, 42. He, I, what did I tell you about him passing John Kerry? Mm -hmm. Not even close. He's a good he even guy. passed Elliot Spitzer, the other Jew boy on there. Elliot Spitzer, 37. I hit this poll, 34, 2.9%. And John Kerry, in fact, the last time we did this, he also came in did last. A distant last. Distant last. How do you like that? And the amazing part of it is he won the 2004 election, only they uh, they juiced up the votes in Ohio. Kerry, 26. Maybe it's, uh, well, no, I was going to say, maybe just as well. It's not just as well. Even if Mortimer Snurd would have been running, it would have been an improvement over what we got now. Pop had Clinton, look what we got, kids. Pop had Al Gore, look what we got. Oh, Dick Cheney, good God. With his lesbian daughter, Mary, by the way, I just mentioned it in passing. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You fairy. She doesn't look Lebanese. Frank Rich, no relation to Fat Rich, rest in peace, in the New York Times writes, five years after 9-11, fear finally strikes out. 
The results are in for the White House's latest efforts to exploit terrorism for political gain. The era of Americans fearing fear itself is over. In each poll released since the foiling of the transatlantic terror plot, Gallup, Newsweek, CBS, Zogby, Pew, George W. Bush's approval rating remains stuck in the 30s. About 30, man. Just as it has been with a little let up as in the year since Katrina stripped the last remaining fig leaf of credibility from his presidency. While the new Middle East promised by Condi Rice remains a delusion, the death rattle of the domestic political order we've lived with since 9-11 can be found everywhere. In Americans' unhysterical reaction to the terror plot, in politicians' and pundits' hysterical overreaction to Joe Lieberman's defeat in Connecticut, even in the ho-hum box office reaction to Oliver Stone's World Trade Center. It's not as if the White House didn't put out all the stops to milk the terror plot to further its politics of fear. One self-congratulatory presidential photo op was held at the National Counterterrorism Center, a dead ringer for the set in 24. But Mr. Bush's Jack Bauer is no more persuasive than his Tom Cruise of Top Gun. By crying wolf about terrorism way too often, usually when a distraction is needed from bad news in Iraq, he and his administration have long since become comedy fodder, and not just on The Daily Show. June's scenario was particularly choice. As Baghdad imploded, Alberto Gonzalez breathlessly unmasked a Miami terror cell plotting a full ground war and the destruction of the Sears Tower, even though the alleged cell had no concrete plans, no contacts with terrorist networks, no equipment, including boots. What makes the four of London Pakistan plot seem more of a serious threat, though not so serious it disrupted Tony Blair's vacation, is that the British vouched for it, not Attorney General Gonzalez and his Keystone cops. This didn't stop Michael Chertoff from grabbing credit in his promotional sprint through last Sunday's talk shows. It was as if we had an opportunity to stop 9-11 before it actually was carried out, he said, insinuating himself into that royal we. But no matter how persistent his invocation of 9-11, our Secretary of Homeland Security is too discredited to impress the public that has been plenty disillusioned since Karl Rove first exhibited the flag grape remains of a World Trade Center victim in a 2004 campaign commercial. We look at Mr. Chertoff and still see the man who couldn't figure out what was happening in New Orleans when the catastrophe was being broadcast in real time on live TV. No matter what the threat was at hand, he can't get his story straight. When he said last weekend that the foiling of the London plot revealed Al-Qaeda in disarray because it's been five years since they've been capable of putting together something of this sort, he didn't seem to realize that he was flatly contradicting the Ashcroft Gonzalez claims for the gravity of all the Al-Qaeda plots they boasted of stopping in those five years. As recently as last October, Mr. Bush himself announced a list of ten grisly foil plots, including one he later described as a Qaeda plan ready to set into motion to fly a hijacked plane into the tallest building on the West Coast. Dick, Dick Cheney's credibility is also nil. He'll always be the man who told us that Iraqis would greet our troops as liberators and that the insurgency was in its last throes in May of last year. His latest and predictable effort to exploit terrorism for election year fear-mongering, arguing that Ned Lamont's descent on Iraq gave comfort to al-Qaeda types, has no traction because the public has long since untangled the administration's bogus linkage between the Iraq war and al-Qaeda. Uh. That's why of all the poll findings last week, the most revealing was the one in the CBS survey. While the percentage of Americans who chose terrorism as our most important problem increased in the immediate aftermath of the London plot, terrorism still came in second at only 17% to Iraq at 28%. The administration's constant refrain that Iraq is the central front in the war on terror is not only false, but now has also backfired politically. Only 9% of the CBS poll felt that our involvement in Iraq was helping decrease terrorism. As its fifth anniversary arrives, 9-11 itself has been dwarfed by the mayhem in Iraq, where more civilians are now killed per month than died in the attack on America. The box office returns of World Trade Center are a cultural sign of just how much America has moved on. For all the debate about whether it was too soon for such a Hollywood movie, it did better in the Northeast where such concerns were most prevalent than in the rest of the country where, like United 93, it may have arrived too late. Despite wild acclaim from conservatives and an accompanying email campaign, World Trade Center couldn't outdraw Step Up, a teen romance starring a former Abercrombie and Fitch model and playing on 500 fewer screens. Mr. Lamont's victory in the Connecticut Democratic Senatorial primary has been overhyped as Mr. Stone's movie. As a bellwether of national politics, one August primary in one very blue state is nearly meaningless. Mr. Lieberman's star began to wane in Connecticut well before Iraq became a defining issue. His approval rating at home as measured by the Quinnipiac poll had fallen from 80% in 2000 to 51% in July of 2003, and that was before his kamikaze presidential bid turned Joe Mentum into a national joke. The hyperbole that has greeted the Lamont victory in some quarters is far more revealing than the victory itself. In 2006, the tired row strategy of equating any Democratic politician's opposition to the Iraq war with cut-and-run defeatism in the war on terror looks desperate. The Republicans are protesting too much, methinks. A former Greenwich select man like Mr. Lamont isn't easily slimed as a reincarnation of Abby Hoffman or an ally of Osama bin Laden. 
What Republicans really see in Mr. Lieberman's loss is not a defeat in the war on terror, but the specter of their own defeat. Mr. Lamont is but a passing embodiment of a fixed truth. Most Americans think the war in Iraq was a mistake and want some plan for a measured withdrawal. That truth would prevail even if Lamont had lost. A similar panic can be found among the wave of pundits, some of them self-proclaimed liberals, who apoplectically fret that Mr. Lamont's victory signals the hijacking of the Democratic Party by the far left, here represented by virulent bloggers, and a prospective replay of its electoral apocalypse of 1972. Whatever their political affiliation, almost all of these commentators suffer from the same syndrome. They supported the Iraq war, and with few exceptions, mainly at the Wall Street Journal and the Weekly Standard, are now embarrassed that they did. Desperate to assert their moral superiority after misjudging a major issue of our time, they loftily declared that anyone who shares Mr. Lamont's pronounced opposition to the Iraq war is not really serious about the war against the jihadists who attacked us on 9-11. That's just another version of the Cheney-Lieberman argument, and it's hogwash. Most of the 60% of Americans who oppose the war in Iraq also want to win the war against al-Qaeda and its metastasizing allies. That's one major reason they don't want America bogged down in Iraq. Mr. Lamont's public statements put him in that camp as well, which is why those smearing him resort to the cheap trick of citing his leftist great-uncle, the socialist Corliss Lamont, while failing to mention that his father was a Republican who served in the next administration. Mr. Lieberman, ever bipartisan, has accused Mr. Lamont of being both a closet Republican and a radical. These commentators are no more adept at reading the long-term implications of the Connecticut primary than they were at seeing through blatant White House propaganda about Sodom's mushroom clouds. Their generalizations about the blogosphere are overheated. The shrillest left-wing voices on the Internet are no more representative of the whole than those of the far right. This country remains a country of the center, and opposition to the war in Iraq is now the center, and if you listen to Chuck Hagel and George Will, among other neoconservatives, even the center right. As the election campaign quickens, genuine nightmares may, may well usurp the last gasps of Robian fear-based politics. It's hard to ignore the tragic reality that American troops are caught in the crossfire of a sectarian bloodbath escalating every day, that botched American policy has strengthened Iran and Hezbollah and undermined Israel, and that the Department of Homeland Security is ill-equipped now to prevent explosives, liquid or otherwise, in cargo as it was on 9-11. For those who presided over this debacle and must face the voters in November, this is far scarier stuff than a foiled terrorist cell, nasty bloggers, and Ed Lamont combined. This is Neil Rogers. This is 560 QAM. 6, 2006, that will be in a report date uh, to determine whether or not Mr. Clark has been uh, picked up by the state of Colorado. Thank you very much. There's the extradition hearing. John uh, Mark Carr, aren't you excited? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's uh, been ordered extradited to uh, Boulder. And what they're going to do is drop a huge boulder right on his pear-shaped ass. And here he goes. He's got the orange jumpsuit on looking really so He's got a pear-shaped ass. Oh, it just got the rail. And when I'm up in Boca Chica slapping all the women with painted lips around the pool, I listen to the Neil Rogers one to two hours. Yeah, I mean, I listen to the Neil Rogers fair and balanced one to two hours. Did you ever want to chew the gum of preaching these dirty teeth? Well, to do it, you gnaw and chew it very fast so you can taste the pungent flavor of a bit to be sweet and get the sticky stack of toenail to last. How many times have you fantasized about Britney Spears? Well, now your dream can come true with Britney Spearman Feet Gum. Little wads of gum that stuck to Britney's bare feet as she walked through the streets of New York City to see the big concrete buildings. The gum wads were peeled off her feet soon as she found it difficult to walk and carefully packaged to help make your breath fresh as a subway toilet. Get the gooey, chewy flavor of Britney's stinky feet with Britney Spearman feet gum. Public defender who was assigned uh, to basically uh, represent him for this proceeding. Uh, oh, my God. After Quietly, oh for the most part, uh, stoically, not wearing his prison-issued blues, but it certainly looked like prison-issued garb that he was wearing, sort of an orange-colored jump. The ship has landed. It's Michael Rennie, make no mistake about it. Back to uh, the jail in order to get his belongings, his clothes, uh, before he is transported. Uh, One of them big old eggs that was on the ship had hatched. His charges there, and it's still unclear when he would go back to Colorado, whether that flight would be at some point today, although we understood earlier from many legal experts that they would try to get him out of here as soon as possible. And Chris, you heard what happened in there. Uh, the judge asked him uh, very quickly at the top of uh, uh, 10 o'clock local time uh, whether he understood uh, the complaint that had been charged against him in Colorado. In fact, read them, said that there were five charges that he was faced with, including murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault of a minor. Uh, he said that he basically had the right uh, to, to waive 
um, the uh, the extradition, and in fact uh, asked him whether he would do that. And John Carr said that he would. And then he held up the waiver. We presume we didn't see it, but somebody in the courtroom held up uh, the the uh, the court documents and asked him whether he understood what he was looking at. He said yes. He said if you understand, do you understand? Most of the people in your courtroom are holding up their middle finger. Do so you understand what you're looking at? Uh huh. I don't understand what I'm looking at. What is that? Him. Oh. I'm telling you, man, it's uh, got a pear-shaped ass. That's a pear. And Creatures with a pear-shaped ass are not like real human, okay? Johnny Dark now, here's a pear-shaped ass. Here's a fax. Now, let me ask you. He was ter- One of the charges was uh, sexual assault. I, all these uh, t- talking heads, all these experts have been saying for these last 10 years, that she wa- and including lately, the uh, 4,000 hours we've seen this weekend, uh, she wasn't sexually assaulted. Well, Isn't that right? Guess again. Oh. Or at least she wasn't raped at it, Okay. I don't want to get too um, yeah, maybe pinched her. descriptive here because Joyce will get all bent out of shape. She gets real nervous when we get anywhere below the waist. Here's a fax that really just, I don't even know what to say about this. It's so sad. I'm curious if you've seen Randy Rhodes' upcoming book and if you intend to read it, says the fax. It goes on to say, it is unbelievable to me that a lightweight like her has become one of America's leading left-wing intellectuals. One of America's leading left-wing intellectuals. I wish that someone would roll out some of her old tapes from WYOD. Of course, Time Magazine also recently named Miss Matt Drudge as one of America's most influential people. And there's a new book that claims that he is the new generation's Walter Cronkite, despite the fact that Drudge can barely string a few sentences together. He doesn't need to, okay? He ought to be doing 10 to 20, just one sentence. Him and his buddy Richard Mellon Scaife. I chafe when I think of Richard Mellon Scaife. You are absolutely correct. America has become one big celebration of mediocrity, it says. Oh, now you're finally starting to catch on. Also, did you see the report in today's Herald about a revived stadium plan in downtown Miami? No, I did not. Didn't see it. Don't care. Let me know when they build a stadium. Let me know when it's built. If they build it, I uh, won't come. How's that? All right. George won't go there. Josh will go there, though. He'll be uh, he'll be ready, although it depends on where they build it. Oh, well, you know, if right. they do one of those producer nights uh, at the ballpark with free food and booze. Free food. Yeah. I'll think free about sex, it. free food, free uh, weed. Sure. Free transportation, limo. 1179, right. pick them up in a limo and take them there and just wine them and dine them and booze them and cruise them and schmooze them. Who should the Democrats run for president in 2008? We've got 1179 votes. We're going to go over 1,200 votes today right during the show, right here in like in the middle in broad daylight. Al Gore, 324, rhymes with Gore and Boer. Howard Dean, 174. You see that? How's Leslie Gore doing? It's her party. The Democrats, her party. I don't care, 145. Barack Obama, 121. Hillary, 108. Not, not all that well among our crowd, and rightfully and deservedly so. Oh, look who they have on MSNBC. And then into one of the garage areas. Oh, my God. There, which entrance he would go in. Oh, There's a few entrances. Oh, my God. But we may be able to get Somebody call 911 and help this person. The car. Again, what I observed there was a very sort of quiet, you know, John Mark Carr sitting there. Uh, <laughs> you know, not saying a lot. This person shouldn't be making fun wow. of Rita Crosby like that. Wow. Hillary won away, John Edwards, 89, Joe Biden, 74, Russ Feingold, 45, who went from nowhere. He was a late addition without Wolf Blitzkrieg. Russ Feingold, 45, Elliot Spitzer, 37, I hate this poll, 36, 3%, and John Kerry, still just way, way, way in the back of the pack with an old sack, 26. You know who the old sack is? Teresa, with all her money, all her ketchup, all her Heinz, 57. 26 votes. Well, I saw, where the hell did I see it? On one of these... Uh, Maybe it's in one of these movies. Maybe it was in uh, Why We Fight. I don't know. One of these where they showed uh, 2004 where Carrier was uh, nominated. Mm-hmm. She was she was absolutely blitzed. I mean, hey, when you can afford it. Even Dresden never got blitzed like she was. I mean, it was just unbelievable. When you can afford the good stuff, why not now, be honest? Honest? She's got it, man. That's right. If Sigourney Weaver really wants the good stuff, call up Teresa Hines Carey, sweetheart. She's got 57,000 yeah. varieties. And if she's Evidently. asleep, leave a message. Matt Crenson writes, nobody's come up with our SBTC. I thought for sure we'd have a lot of really creative people calling in with that. Or just a lot of creative people calling in. Didn't happen. 5670560. I mean, to me, of course, once we find the DNA, that's going to be the most important thing, right? Yes. 
Although if the DNA doesn't match, that doesn't prove anything. They, they pointed out that uh, the DNA that was found in her panties could have been from the factory. Anybody ever stop and think about that? Although we don't want to talk about JonBenet's panties. Okay, what were they doing with those at the factory? No, but, but I'm just saying it could have been from, uh, you don't understand, people no, handle... Being funny, I know. Oh, are you starting again with panty talk? Yes. 5670560, oh, SBTC, we're still waiting. Pound 560 on the Verizon Singular Wireless Line. Is this a creative audience or, no. or what, huh? Are these people really into that? Maybe they just don't care about this. That poll you took on them for over the weekend, 40-some percent said they don't, want, they don't know from this crap. I'm in custody, right. so everybody seems to be on the same. Food murder, kidnapping, sexual assault, uh, impersonating a human being, all, these, all of these things. Uh, all of these things. things. WQAM, hello. I heard that. WQAM, hello. Yes, uh, I said, hey, have a good day. WQAM, we'll try it again. Hello. Hey, Neil. Yes, sir. What happened to the crossover with Hank? Hank's not on in the morning anymore, schmuck. Get lost. Uh, five, six, seven, uh, oh, five, well, tell you, seriously, this audience, man, I wouldn't wish them on, uh, on uh, Ava Gabor. It's just, it's unbelievable. It's just amazing. Just retard city. And I'm sitting here, you know, th this is the thing, because I enjoy it, and George sure. likes it, so th that's it. That's all we care about. Josh likes but it. But I'm sitting here reading all this stuff and pretending, not that I think it's going to make even the tiniest iota, not a scrapola of difference in the, in the history of our lives. But, you know, it's something at least I feel a little productive, informative, whatever. I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to a bunch of breathing idiots out there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's the best they can do. And it isn't like now. It isn't uh, because I'm reading. It's been right. this way for how many years? About 30, man. As long as I can remember. It's either this crowd of mouth breathers or back at me. Hello, doctor. I've got <laughs> blue lips, doctor. What can I do, doctor? This is Neil oh, Rogers. Oh, 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 oh. This is 560 QAM. The Middle Eastern world will be exploded. Saddam had people killed with the gas that we sold him. First time aggressor nation and the only one that's growing. Now more blood will be spilled to get that oil flowing. Forget about Korea and the nukes they're toting. And the right wing is drilling it over and over into our heads. That Iraq has some weapons of mass destruction. I'm dying out of here. Abu Ghraib. Right. Three thousand people killed are now forgotten. Let's exploit them instead. Hey, there's oil to be gotten. Going after Saddam to placate Osama. There's no longer mention of the name Bin Laden. But no one seems concerned. All of being complacent. Believing every word of this cartel administration. That controls us by fear through media manipulation. And the right wing is drilling it over and over into our heads. That Iraq has some weapons of mass destruction. The loss of civil rights is the price that we're paying. We're all suspects now, not the Ashcroft is saying. I have nothing to hide, table talkers all are saying. Blind, obedient cattle don't have any reservation. Without unprovoked battle and world annihilation. Old regimes must fall and have a virgin installed. With no objection at all, Democrats don't have the balls and the right wing is drilling it over and over into our brainwashed head. <laughs> Iraq has some weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> Only Iraq has some weapons of mass destruction. Look at that. There's Kendall Coffey who never saw a camera he didn't like. He's pontificating away about, uh, not the pontiff, but about John Mark Carr. Defense cases can create fodder for defense lawyers. Down. For your fodder, for your fodder. <laughs> Mo dad. Mo for the money and Mo dad. Uh, by the way, your, uh, the good news is trials of Henry Kissinger and the hunting of the president will be there tomorrow. All right.
How do you like that? It's stupendous. Give me something for the weekend. I'm going to tell you something, man. These are Amazon.com. They don't monkey around. They're, no, they they're just they're tremendous. They're unbelievable is what they are. And the good news is, let's see, it's 20, 27 bucks for the um, Kissinger one, but the other one is on, it's like uh, almost nothing. It's wow. almost for free. Isn't that funny? The Hunting of the President, nine ninety eight plus recapable uh, tax. Uh, Nicholas Perry, Hunting of the President, and Trials of Henry Kissinger, Eugene Jarecki, also who produced the uh, Why We Fight video. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh, yeah, let's talk about these different uh, DVDs that people ought to be watching, and, say, and they won't. Well, why do I waste my time? Why, why am I talking about this crap? Aye, 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 aye. Yeah, exactly. 1,216 votes on the poll. They like Al Gore. And like I said before, he's only five points behind Swillery in the latest uh, poll of Democrats nationwide. At least that gives us a little bit of hope. Because she, I think she's got a loser written all over her ass, you know? And I don't think her ass is even pear-shaped. No, it's more like an apple. Oh, God. A in fact, the rotten apple is what I would think. Rotten to the core. Maybe a pumpkin. I hear there's maybe a little worm in it. William Gr <laughs> William Grider writes, Identity Crisis in the Nation. He writes for the Nation. You know William Grider? He's great. No, I don't know him. Oh, yeah, you do. We put his columns on the website. You don't put his stuff on the website when you're... Uh, oh, that guy. Him? No. Why the hell not? I don't know. I might have. I don't read the You better get with it, mister. You sure don't know your, uh, your intellectuals. No, like no, Randy I, Rhodes. No, I don't. Like, uh, well, well, she's got I, a I didn't book know that. coming out. Oh, oh. Did you see the story I had the other day about Air America and about how weak and lame? And uh, Did you see that? No. Oh. But I knew oh, that. It wasn't about the air talent so much. It was about the promotional, the fact they're making an impact like a fart in a windstorm, mm -hmm. which is correct. William Grider says the question of party identity takes on weird new relevance now that Joe Lieberman is cross-dressing in Connecticut. Defeated once as a Democrat, tiresome Joe is now running again as an independent. Only he says he's still a loyal Dem at heart. How can we know he's not lying? Carl Rove and Republicans appear to think otherwise. They're pouring serious money into Lieberman's campaign and dumping a classic Republican smear job on Ned Lamont, the legitimate Democrat. Ned, remember, beat Joe fair and square in the party primary. But Joe agrees with Carl that Ned is a threat to the Republic because Lamont thinks Bush's war in Iraq is a bloody catastrophe, as do nearly two-thirds of the American public. Something about this odd drama doesn't pass the smell test. I suspect Carl and Joe have made a deal. A back-scratching understanding, you might say. Carl says to Senator Joe... We will help you beat Ned in the general election, and you will agree to cross over and sign up for the Republicans if we need your vote to retain our majority in the Senate. Joe says, it's a deal, but only if my fellow Democrats make a sincere effort to support Ned and defeat me. Otherwise, if the Dems go limp and sell out Ned, I have to stay loyal. <coughs> Carl, fair enough. How do we make the terms of the deal clear to everyone without announcing it? Joe, you very publicly dumped the no-name Republican candidate in the race. I started attacking the patriotism of anti-war Democrats like Bernie Sanders, who was running for senator in Vermont. We both cut up Ned Lamont with the same vicious slurs, portraying him as a fellow traveler for Al-Qaeda. Carl, excellent. I have a hit group called Vets for Freedom who will start tossing the mud. Joe, my Democratic pals will understand completely. This is the kind of bipartisan civility I've always sought in politics. And then William Grider goes on to say, Okay, I can't prove any of the above, but at least it's clear that the devious and undependable Lieberman has devised a very nasty dilemma for his erstwhile friends in the Democratic Party. Most of them have declared their support for the party nominee, Ned Lamont, and at least some of them seem sincere. That demonstrates the party establishment's respect for the new energies that Lamont's anti-war supporters are bringing to the party. But Joe's flagrant turncoat routine effectively warns the party regulars to back off or else. His suggested logic goes like this. The Democrats will win the Connecticut Senate seat by doing nothing from the national level since it's either going to be Lamont or Lieberman. But if the party establishment provokes Joe by putting real heft behind Lamont's campaign, then it risks losing the seat. If Joe wins with the heavy support provided by Bush and Republicans, he may feel compelled to walk out. Some Democrats, I hear this secondhand, are flirting with this go-limp strategy. Others are arguing intensely that the party has no option except to put all of its weight behind the party nominee and, in effect, make damn sure that Ned wins. Above all, they have to demonstrate their commitment to Lamont followers, those new rank-and-file forces who harbor deep skepticism about the party's timid leadership. If Democrats fail to demonstrate their genuineness, they may very well create a much more serious problem for the party down the road. A Lieberman victory, regardless of how it occurs, would encourage the rebels and insurgents from within the party to skip party primaries as bogus events and run their challenge candidates in the general elections, just like Wayward Joe. These rebel challengers might not win, but they could rally enough to send any voters to bring down a lot of incumbent Democrats. Joe tossed party identity out the window. Why shouldn't they? This would be a far bloodier path to reinvigorating the Democratic Party, bringing it down in order to rebuild it. But some reform agitators have noticed that it works. Fratricidal bloodletting was how the Republican right got its groove and gained its power over the other party. 
fratricidal bloodletting. Awful lot of bloodletting going on, you know what? Yeah. In fact, this president's got more blood on his hands. He's got enough to feel like the Mediterranean Sea, if you ask me. I could be wrong yeah, about that, but I don't think so. They have 10 days to bring him here from California, 10 business days, and that would be... But does he, now, let's see, on a flight to Boulder, does he get, like, champagne and uh, rock lobster? Hey, and hey, back to you, because we've been looking at... Where does he get rock lobster? From at the top of the hour, and you see, uh, this is from the... By the way, it was Al, uh, Orlando Al's query that started those rumors about the place across the street. Just thought I would mention that, and Josh Cordes ain't too the happy diner? about it. Josh got to take him to the woodshed for that, is what I'm hearing. Got a whip? Didn't they take out to the woodshed? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, I hear that Duff is going to take you out to the woodshed and give you what for. 1,225 votes. I think we got like an outside. Well, we got a shot at 1,250. Let's not get crazy here, okay? Let's not yeah, go yeah. for 13. It's an unlucky number anyway, wouldn't you think? We believe that he'll be removed uh, forthwith from the jurisdiction. Forthwith. He's on his way, baby, and he ain't going to San Jose. He's going from L.A. to Boulder. Ever been in Boulder, Colorado? I can't say that I can't have. Can't say that I have. Never been in Colorado, period. I have been to Denver a few times. Oh, gee, what a horrible right-wing place. In it's fact, a I would say it's like hub. one step away from Arizona, and geographically, of course, it's like one breath away. Uh, well, politically it might be, but it's uh, you know got mountains and it's got water. Yeah. Arizona's got uh, Las Montañas. Does it, does it have water? A lot of cacti. 1,229 votes on the pool. Al Gore, 339. And John Kerry still sucking wind way, way down the road. 27. This is Neil Rogers. And the bread's on 11. Oh. This is 560 QAM. I have just tasted your snapper. Well, congratulations. Get a life. This is Debbie. Yeah, hi, Debbie. I'm interested in getting some operations done. Okay. And some body contouring and some liposuction. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if you get some tummy tuck and uh, lip augmentation, cosmetic breast surgery, face lift, all of these things. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering... What would you like to start with? Well, I, I need to get everything done. Probably the first thing I'd like to have removed is my, uh, my thing. Okay, we don't do that. No. Could you do breast implants, though? Uh, it can be done, but mm. I don't know what they would do it right away. It puts the lotion in the basket. Mm-hmm. How much? Uh, 5000 Excellent. I'd like to have my skin resurfaced, too. Mm-hmm. Laser surgery. Mm-hmm. Have the lambs stopped crying yet, Mommy? Excuse me? Don't hurt Mommy's little baby. It puts the lotion in the basket. I'd like to get the liposuction that I saw on TV. Okay. Can you make me look more like a woman? Well, we'll have to see you first, and then yeah. upon looking at you, we can tell you that when we see you. Should I wear my skin suit made of body parts, Mommy? Uh, if you'd like to. It puts the lotion in the basket. Would you like to make an appointment? Yes. Okay. Um, there is a $100 consultation fee. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Um. My name is Buffalo Bill. Okay, let me get a little Mommy. information from you, okay? Just Mommy. one moment. You, it right? puts the lotion in the basket. I understand. It puts the lotion in the basket. Do you want to come in for a consultation? For it life? puts the lotion in the basket. Okay. Do you, would you like to make an appointment, or do you want to call me back? Or? It puts the lotion in the basket. I understand. I've got my skin suit and nipple necklace. Bill. It puts the lotion in the basket. I understand that. Would you like to it puts the lotion in the basket. Would you like to make an appointment? It puts the lotion in the basket. Okay, I will talk to you another time, okay? It puts the lotion in the basket. Hello? But what's he really trying to say? It puts the lotion in the basket. Oh, okay, 131, 29 till 2. We got Curtis Stevenson at 2. Oh. Let's get back to the sanctity of sports, baby. Yeah, baby. Curtis Stevenson at 2. Then we got uh, Mad Dog at 4. This is the last week of this horseball lineup. Then next week we really get cereal, you know? Next week, we got the brand-new lineup. We're going to lay it out. Kenny Walker. Everybody knows Kenny Walker, don't they? No. Never heard of him. He's going to be on there with Kimba Bowcamper in the morning. Kenny to kind of wake you up, and Kimba to get you, like, back into a semi-comatose state. We're staying put, man, right here at 10 to 2. Then yeah. Mad Dog, 2 to 5. The Humper, 4 to 7, which means they overlap. They work together between 4 and 5. They're going to be doing the cross-dress hour. And then after that, uh, you're on your own. we got ball games and stuff, baseball and hockey and foosball, all that stuff. Rami Curry... Guess who Rami Curry? I wonder if he's kin to Kid Curry, who resigned because of health reasons. Did you did you explore that with anybody and find out what that was all about? No. You don't care? Boy, you are a heartless bastard. Uh, that's not what I said. I thought you liked Kid Curry. I still do. He's always very nice to us. 
Yes. Rami Curry is the editor of the Beirut-based Daily Star. I just mentioned that to give a little uh, you know, insight as to who this guy is. This was printed by the Guardian UK, though, which is where you get the good stuff, the Guardian and the Independent. Israel and the U.S. are still focused on the wrong issues, he says. Every major political issue, Lebanon, Iraq, radicalism, links back to the festering Israeli-Palestinian conflict, he writes. What's that fax you just sent? It's a submission. Stupid Bush terrorizes the country. I like that. SBTC. Excellent job. Very good. SBTC. I don't think these people even know what I'm talking about. What are you talking about? I don't know. I'm talking about the only thing anybody in the world is talking about, John K. Hakara, whatever his name is. Just a man who feels that his life is about to change quite dramatically. Does he feel the pressure of what is going on here? Well, again, I can't speak to what he feels. But... Yeah, I feel this with his pear-shaped ass. Anyway, Rami Curry says we have a very simple choice before us in the Middle East. We can get serious about working together to give the people of this region a chance to live normal lives in peace and security, or we can all act silly in the ways of provincial chieftains, as many public figures in Lebanon, Syria, Iran, Israel, and the U.S. have done in recent days. The chances of achieving a region-wide peace in the Middle East are slim to non-existent right now because the key non-Arab players are focusing on the wrong issues. They're trying to manage or eliminate the symptoms of our region's tensions instead of addressing the root causes. Hezbollah and Iran are among the best examples of this. Israel and the U.S. are obsessed with disarming Hezbollah and confronting Iran, but a quarter of a century ago, neither of these issues existed. How Hezbollah and Iran became so problematic is worth recalling. Until 1979, Iran under the Shah was a close ally and friend of the U.S. and Israel, and Hezbollah didn't even exist. What happened in the three decades from the mid-70s to today? Many things. The most consistent one was that we all allowed the Arab-Israeli conflict to fester unresolved. Its bitterness kept seeping out from its Palestine-Israel core to corrode many other dimensions of the region. The constant clashes between Israel and Lebanon since the late 1960s derived heavily from the unresolved Palestinian-Israeli conflict that started with the 1948 war. Since Iran's 1979 revolution, Islamist revolutionary zeal has found effective expression in its close association with Hezbollah, which Iranian Revolutionary Guards were instrumental in establishing and training. Tehran's assistance to Hamas today follows a similar pattern. A non-Arab power such as Iran exploits the resentment against Israel and the U.S. throughout the Arab world to make political inroads into Arab regions. If the Arab-Israeli conflict had been resolved decades ago, Iran wouldn't have this opportunity. Hezbollah has many people working backwards. While the American-Israeli effort to disarm Hezbollah aims mainly to protect Israel, the fact is that Hezbollah has developed its military capability primarily in response to a need to protect Lebanon from repeated Israeli attacks in the past four decades. Lebanese calls to disarm Hezbollah are motivated more by a desire to prevent the party from bringing more ruin from Israeli attacks or to prevent it from taking over the country's political system and aligning it with Syria and Iran. The way to end Hezbollah's status as the only non-state armed group in Lebanon is to rewind the reel and go to the heart of the problem that caused Hezbollah to develop its formidable military capabilities in the first place. If we solve the Arab-Israeli conflict in a fair manner, according to UN resolutions, we would eliminate two critical political forces that now nourish Hezbollah's armed defiance, the Israeli threat to Lebanon, and the ability of Syria and Iran to exploit the ongoing conflict with Israel by working through Lebanon. Iran has its own reasons, including some valid ones, for developing a full nuclear fuel cycle, though the potential atomic weapons capability that derives from this is more problematic. Iran's political meddling in Lebanon and other Arab lands is another issue, yet it is linked umbilically to the, asser the assertion of Islamist identity, Shia empowerment, anti-Western defiance and domestic challenges to autocratic Arab regimes, four dynamics that have often been associated with and exacerbated by the ongoing Arab-Israeli conflict. Israel's persistent attempts to secure its place in the region by military force have always generated a greater Arab will to fight and now also supported by Iran. Local attempts to secure its borders, occupations, surrogate armies, cross-border attacks, separation walls, massive punishment and humiliation of civilian populations have not worked for Israel and only generate more determined and capable resistance as with Hezbollah. Israel will also fail in its desire to subcontract its security to foreign or regional states as it's attempting to do through the international force in South Lebanon or by having Turkey prevent arms shipments to Hezbollah from Iran. Every tough issue in this region, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Iran, terrorism, radicalism, armed resistance groups, is somehow linked to the consequences of the festering Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The politicians and government leaders who dominate this region or engage it from Western capitals all look like rank amateurs or intemperate brutes as they flail at symptoms instead of grappling with the core issue that's seen the region spin off in ever greater circles of violence since the 70s. 
A comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace agreement is achievable from the Arab side to judge by the repeated offering of the 2002 Arab Summit peace proposal. Israel and the U.S. must quickly decide if they too can become sensible and work for a comprehensive peace is the most effective way to reduce and then reverse the cycles of resentment, radicalism, and resistance that now define much of the Arab-Islamic Middle East. Makes too much sense to yeah, me. It doesn't Let's just go happen. in there and bomb Iran. Ah, right. That'll make That's them love us. Talking about. Let's go in there and nuke them. Crazy people. Let's just have the whole Middle East just boil over into a screaming, and then, of course, the whole world. Sure. WW3. But what's that got to do with John Bonet? You know what? If he's not crazy, then he's a murderer. And if he's a murderer, insanity may very well be his defense. So to come out publicly... You know, this is the new thing. I'm sure you've noticed. I'm sure everybody's noticed. But it's, it's spreading like a cancer. The shrill, screaming oh, yeah. broads that are on all these. And, of course, Nancy Grace was one of the very first. Nancy she, Grace. She, they all, yeah, they all want to be Nancy Grace Jr. now, only shriller and louder and more uh, demonic and more uh, grotesque. Another one was that uh, Gloria Allred, that mm -hmm. bitch. And now there's, uh, everywhere you turn, they, they've got some broad on MSNBC who's supposed to be a news reader in the daytime, and now she's doing, like, editorial commentaries. She's another one. I think she's uh, joined with, at the hip with Wolf Blitzkrieg over at CNN. Oh, poor little Israel, and she's just sitting on there editorializing and talking up a storm. She hasn't got any idea what the hell she's talking about. But a beep, but a boop, but about shrill talking head bitches, man. Maybe that's what that B stands for in SBTC. Shrill bitches terrorizing uh, the continent. All right. How's that? I'll take it. I'm sure that the C could stand for something else. What? <laughs> I ain't going to tell you, C. <laughs> you can't spell Bush without BS. 1,255 votes. You know, if you'd have pushed on this, Josh, we'd have made the 1,300. If oh, you'd have sorry. The, my bad. If you'd, have, if you'd have leaned on it, you know? And what kind of guys actually do sleep in the same, you know, like in the same bed? Pear-shaped asses? Guys with pear-shaped asses and funny-looking glasses, kind of like Robert Grieper. This is Neil Rogers. You fair. This is 560 QAM. Hi, this is Larry King, and they don't come any better than Neil Rogers. Only $50. Roll out the barrel, expensive barrel of oil. Pay for the barrel, and it will make your blood boil. Fight me, you Arabs, and Venezuela too. Now's the time to put the barrel up a certain part of you. Shove it in there, boy. Shove this oil barrel right where the sun don't shine. Got us over a barrel, but we've got a new thing in mind. We'll fill our own barrels with what we grow on. Um, 145, only 15 away from uh, Curtis Stevenson and very important sports craft. Iran rejected a deal on its uranium enrichment program backed by the U.S. and other global powers today, but its rejection was not outright. In spite of the rejection, Iran has apparently offered a new formula to resolve the issue through negotiations, according to Ali uh, Al Alam, the Iranian TV channel, Al Alam. They're on the lam. And meanwhile, an Iranian news agency is reporting that the nation's supreme leader has lashed out. Uh, and U.S. President George W. Bush threatening to smash the arrogant powers if huge powers become involved in the current nuclear standoff. You can't. You gotta love the foreign policy of this uh, bunch, don't you? Sure. What's what is it like? Farce news agency closely affiliated with the Iranian judiciary has quoted Ayatollah Khomeini, not to be confused with Ayatollah Khomeini, who uh, croaked and nearly fell out of the plane when they were like transporting his casket. Remember that? Yeah. Now, actually, the casket did fall out, and the body like whoop, he's rolling down the uh, <coughs> runway. Uh, but Ayatollah Khomeini has called on Muslim leaders to join together to paralyze the U.S. This person, Bush, speaks as if he were the master and owner of Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, Syria, Iran, and other Muslim states. But if the huge power of nations come to the scene, as it happened in Lebanon, it will smash the arrogant power so badly that the enemies of Islam will no longer be able to continue with their rude and arrogant behavior, said Ayatollah Khomeini. While addressing a public meeting on Tuesday, also attended by the heads of the three branches of government, the Expediency Council chairman, the state and military officials, and a partridge in a pear tree. And by the way, most of the food was treif. He said that the world hegemonic powers had pinned much hope on the former dictator of Iran, meaning the Shah, 
And he reminded him, but Imam Khomeini provided a huge service for this nation and brought Iranians to the scene. A bunch of Getchkis. If the same pattern of vigilance takes place in all the Islamic states and Muslim nations come to the scene, the U.S. and other Arab powers of the world will be paralyzed in the face of the huge power of the nations. Remember what I told you about Mossadegh and about the Shah of Iran, about all of these uh, mm -hmm. things, and the Savak? They used to pull out people's fingernails. The worst torturers and butchers, even maybe worse than the Tantan Makut. You know that old coot? Yeah, I know it. Oh, she's on again. And whichever it is, all the way from, <laughs> Iraq, from the county jail, we're told that it's about a half-hour drive. Uh, so we would probably be able to get some aerial shots of that vehicle that he's in <laughs> once we know that he's being transported. From there, he would be taken to Los Angeles I mean, International Airport. Y you wonder why the public smile, like I was talking about before, why most people are like, blah, 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 like that in America, blah, 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 like that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the Brits, they got Richard Quest, who they put on CNN International in the noon hour, just to, to show you how silly they are, with his donkey teeth. That's why I turned over to MSNBC. I will not watch Richard Quest under any circumcises. If you thought the sight of New Orleans flooded to the eaves, its people trapped in attics or cowering on rooftops was the nightmare hurricane, I better reach over and shut this off. Shut off that monitor. <laughs> why? I should have done that a long time ago. Yeah. Now, do we have any uh, reasonable calls today? Maybe one or two, huh? I, you know, I don't remember. It was so I don't recall any that were like, you know, we couldn't live without. I don't know. Although I do like that one segment there where we had like the whole rush and then all of a sudden oh, just yeah. a, a flick of the finger, man. They all like vanished. They're all watching it together. And of course their motto being... I have no life. If you thought the side of New Orleans flooded to the eaves, its people trapped in attics or cowering on rooftops was the nightmare hurricane scenario, think again. And guess who is passing this information along to us? I can Let up. me give you a clue. Hurricane Center, inarticulate, old fuddy-duddy. Max Mayfield. Oh, that one. I wonder if he's kin to Curtis Mayfield. Gonna make me Director find of the National Hurricane Center says there's plenty of potential for a storm worse than Hurricane Katrina, which killed 1,339 people along the U.S. Gulf Coast and caused some $80 billion in damage last August. And most of the people, by the way, are not back in their homes, and they're still wandering around like a bunch of uh, refugees. People, oh, Curtis Mayfield, all right. People think we have seen the worst we haven't, Mayfield told Reuters in an interview at the Fortress Like Hurricane Center in Miami. I think the day is coming, he said. I think eventually we're going to have a very powerful hurricane in a major metropolitan area, worse than what we saw in Katrina, and it's going to be a mega disaster with lots of lost lives. Not if we can put Brownie Brown back in charge again, if we can get him off those Arabian horses' asses. I don't know whether that's going to be this year or five years from now or a hundred years from now, but as long as we continue to develop the coastline like we are, we're setting up for disaster, said old Max, Mad Max. In fact, I remember back during Katrina, probably the most important thing, that anybody said to Max. Looking back nearly a year to the costliest natural disaster in U.S. history and the third worst hurricane in terms of American lives lost, Mayfield said Katrina itself could have been a greater disaster. More than two days before it struck the Gulf Coast, it had printed the hurricane center printed its future track accurately and warned it could become a powerful Cat 4 on the Saffir Simpson scale of hurricane intensity. New Orleans was squarely in the danger zone and emergency managers and residents had plenty of time to prepare. One of my greatest fears is having people go to bed at night prepared for a Cat 1 and waking up to a Katrina or Andrew, he said. One of these days, it's going to happen. The worst-case hurricane scenario, Mayfield has many in mind. A stronger hurricane closer to New Orleans, a direct hit in the vulnerable Galveston, Houston area. I can just hear Glenn Campbell singing out, can't you? Hey, Glenn. The fragile Florida Keys are heavily populated Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Oh, my God. Or how about a major hurricane racing up the east coast of New York, New Jersey area with its millions of people and billions of dollars of pricey real estate? One of the highest storm surges possible anywhere in the country is where Long Island juts out in really right angles to the Jersey coast. They could get 25 to 30 feet of storm surge. About 30, man. Even going up the Hudson River, Mayfield said. <laughs> <laughs> The subways are going to flood. Some people might think, hey, I'll go into the subways and I'll be safe. No, they're going to flood if this happens, he said. Mayfield, a silver-haired 34-year veteran who just turned 110 of the Hurricane Center, who became its public face in 2000, is a tireless campaigner for hurricane preparation. If he's the public face of the Hurricane Center, does that make John Carr K, uh, K whatever his name is, does that make him the public ass? The public period ass? ass? I am embarrassed, man. Oh, speaking of embarrassing things, I'm sure you discussed this at length. Monday, not. Mm -hmm. Federal judge in Miami Monday dismissed the lead terror count against Jose Padilla, who used to be Jose Padilla, the U.S. citizen once identified as a dirty bomb suspect and detained as an enemy combatant, you dirty rat, with your dirty bomb. How do you like that? I had not heard that. U.S. District Judge Marsha Cook said in a written opinion that the charge, conspiracy to murder, kidnap, and maim, maim persons in a foreign country, duplicated other counts in a federal grand jury and that been handed down last year. 
An indictment is multiplicitous when it charges a single offense multiple times in separate counts, she wrote. As charged, she added, the indictment exposes Padilla and his co-defendants to multiple punishments for a single crime. The indictment, Cook says, alleges and one and only one conspiracy, and some of the facts are realigned each of the consecutive counts. The two remaining counts are conspiracy to provide material support to terrorists and providing material support to terrorists. He's pleaded not guilty of the indictment trial scheduled early next year. Poor Jose Padilla Padilla. I mean, when you got a guy, you can't even, you don't even know what his name is. And there is a Kendall Coffee again there with a skyline of Miami in the background. Kendall, let me start with you because one of the things that oh, was talked about one, in that courtroom and that outside good? by That's the funny. lawyers who spoke wow. with him is their concern about Woo. tainting a jury pool. We don't Paint know who his lawyer is going to be in this Speaking criminal taint, case when he gets back Nancy to Grace Colorado. Doing? But how worried are you doing about what? tainting the jury pool or being able to control the way the picture of John Mark Carr Ooh. gets out to the public? Well, it's a huge issue and an immediate concern, and one of the first things a lawyer is going to do is... is Doesn't he look like Bella Lugosi? They look like strange lighting on him, like they want to make him look like he's in... You know at the amusement park where they have those bizarre mirrors where you look in and the yeah, it's all your... The fun house. World yeah, he, he's case. in the fun house. Kind of coffee in the fun house. Some of the evidence fun. is coming into place. Nothing like having an old cup of coffee in the fun house. Okay, well, uh, you know something? I think we accomplished miracles here today, and especially they found out about... Uh, no! No, not about that. No! Her having that book coming out. Aren't you going to be reading that from yeah, cover to cover? Well, I was, gonna hope you, I was hoping you'd read it to me. No, I'm not, I'm not going to be reading on the air. In fact, uh, <laughs> one of the most important things in her book is going to be... Hi, this is Jim. <laughs> love your show, Neil. Love you, love you. This is Neil Rogers. Oh, this is 560 QAM. It's Dave in Miami Town. Absolutely. At 560 WQAM. People all over the world are losing their damn money. Well, that's it. I'm getting off the Lone Express. Enemy bombers approaching. Flash dealers open fire. We got bidders. We got bombers. Warning, warning. Contractors and martyrs. We got profits. High gas prices. They're going up by six cents. Improvised explosive devices. And the world just does not get what it's all for. Of course, you know, this means war. <laughs> I love this There's trouble from roughnecks who fight with their fists. Oh. Money, 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 money. Radical Islam. Are you crazy or something? Way more fun than Vietnam. We got action. Oh, yeah. 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 We got voters. Do you think people will vote for me? I guess. Both too angry to notice. Everyone else will be dead and poor. Hide your money in a mattress. We're all going to die. I love this war. Bye, bye, bye.